And we are live. This is Dark Journalist. Oh, what a fantastic crowd we have out there in the ideas room tonight already. Of course, tonight I am joined by the lovely Olivia. Hi, everybody. And uh, Olivia, all get ready for the magical mystery tour. Step, How so? Step right this way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we saw in real time a UFO threat fall apart. And this is interesting because... They were in quite an interesting um, state, pushing Grush and everything else, as we saw at the congressional hearings, July 26th. That date is going to be very important tonight, so I want you to note it, because as we've been putting together the UFO threat date with the continuity of government date, I'm going to show you the significance of choosing that particular date for those hearings. And um, we really, you know, have been subject to propaganda for about two months around Grush, and it's via News Nation. I'm also going to do an expose tonight on Next Star Media, uh, who are the owners of News Nation, with Chris Cuomo, that paragon of virtue. <laughs> and uh, suddenly they are the kings of the UFO Broadcasting Network. Unfortunately, um, you know, and there's a lot of strange reasons for this, but uh, that whole Next Star thing has been putting UFOs out there in an unusual fashion. Uh, via The Hill and via some of these other uh, publications. And they're also the ones who own uh, the TV station that George Knapp is on, KLAS, in Las Vegas. So we're getting a whole UFO network uh, action here that we're going to get into tonight. And some of those fine details are very, very surprising indeed. There's a lot of dark journalism packed into this episode, so get ready. We're going to do about two hours with you tonight on this special broadcast before I go any further, Miss Olivia, how's the temperature up there? Good. Uh, Sandra Hewitt said Steve Bannon made some interesting comments. Re Trump's Uncle John, Tesla, and the death ray this week. Yeah. Well, here it comes. Finally, uh, the John Trump piece with Tesla is coming forward. We did um, one of the earliest episodes of the X series is Tesla Trump of the time capsule, which really grabs that. And then a follow-up episode right after that. And um, that lays out the foundation right when we started with this. And it's very crucial if you're going to understand some of the dynamics going on in relation to the politics that we're seeing, especially election 2024 politics and, you know, the endless cases against Trump, you're going to have to start to realize, oh, it's a bigger issue even than we realize. And when you get into that state, you start to see all of the UFO influences around President Trump and his own deep, deep connection to aerospace and the UFO file. Um, we're going to find that this is also one of the main pieces around Bobby Kennedy, who's running for president, as we know. And um, there's a big secret way back there, all the way back to the 1960s. And that gets us directly in. If you're uh, someone who follows this program, you're going to know it quite well into the UFO file uh, mystery around the Kennedy assassinations. So that takes us in very deep. And, you know, it's only coming out now about Thane Eugene Caesar. We did a documentary in 2020 called UFO File Assassins, and it was all about ex-protect aerospace assassins. And um, the, the thrust of that whole piece had a section on Thane Eugene Caesar, who's the actual assassin of Bobby Kennedy, although Sirhan uh, was kind of the stooge for the whole thing. And um, in that documentary, we showed how Thane Eugene Caesar had been connected uh, with Lockheed Martin, but not just Lockheed Martin, but Skunk Works. That's where he worked. And we know that that is the headquarters for UFO redevelopment. That whole piece and the Ben Rich piece and the fact that he came out of that is that direct link again somehow of this UFO file around the deep state activity. You get that when you get into Lee Harvey Oswald, um, almost when you get into anything dealing on a high level. 9-11 also has its aspect with the continuity government program and the COG program now um, married in this piece. Uh, around the UFO threat that the CIA is is pushing. So this becomes a very dangerous game that they're playing at this level. And that's why unmasking it becomes, um, you know, really an incredible opening up of the entire geopolitical uh, consequences of the deep state activity that's been in charge of this government 
uh, for a number of years. That's the American deep state we're talking about. Of course, the global aspect uh, runs us into even more deep territory, and we're going to get into all that tonight with the help of, uh, well, we're going to use a number of different sources tonight, including Peter Dale Scott. But what I'm going to do it right at the outset is break down some of what happened to uh, the, the kind of disruption of the CIA UFO op and why this is such a key crucial time. Before I go any further, I'm going to remind you to go to darkjournalist.com, especially if you're new, and sign up for our free newsletter that's going to keep us in touch through the massive uh, censorship that we've been going through on a regular basis on this program, the incredible suppression. And, uh, you know, these are things that when you do what I do, you don't really like to talk about them very much. Some people like to go out there and just rail on about how they're being censored. And I get it. I really do. But I don't spend any energy on that because as long as I can get the message out on these platforms, uh, you know, they have a sp specific terminology for the type of censorship they do to my program. And it is um, de-amplifying. That's what they do. And it's an interesting thing. So where it would show up in certain places, you know, so... It's very interesting when you get into some of that, but the way around so much of that censorship is to go to Dark Journalists, literally uh, take the 30 seconds to sign up for the free newsletter. And what happens there, basically you get a newsletter once a week letting you know the incredible, and I mean incredible shows we have coming up for you, incredible guests, and um, X series, the return of the X series around Labor Day, and... Um, just incredible uh, shows that we have lined up for you in special reports, documentaries, events, the works, the whole thing is coming up uh, all for you this summer and fall. So make sure you stand up and be counted on that newsletter. All right, Miss Olivia, before I dive in, I'm going to give you another chance. There. Ty Dubbins uh, said, DJ, what are your thoughts on the alien incident in Peru? <laughs> Well, you know, I, I think there's all sorts of interesting things and uh, South America has been flagged in my research for a long time because of the unusual uh, things that have taken place there in relation to the UFO file and advanced technology. Um, I will say that uh, what happened is an initial report out of there is turned into kind of a sci-fi fantasy game, but I'm still watching it for legit reports. Some of the videos that are coming out of there make you think that Gaia TV is down there <laughs> <laughs> and that's always a bad thing. Um, so, you know, promoting, things like, oh, it's a faceless alien. You know, they dragged it out of the mud and stuff. Then it turns out the videos from two years ago and it's part of a sci-fi thing. So, you know, being very, very careful with that one, uh, although it is an unusual thing that like the Las Vegas story, which plays into the timeline, uh, we're going to go into the deep state UFO timeline tonight. The timeline for this year uh, that happened, this incident that happened in May, uh, where these aliens landed in the backyard <laughs> of someone in Las Vegas. Um, you know, you've been seeing more of these types of stories, so I'm not surprised that they're kind of, you know, they're doing a little pressure campaign or a, say like a data mining campaign with the public around the UFO file, and certainly encounters are a major part of that. Everyone you're watching the Dark Journalist show, this is X election 2024, the COG election. And it's the CIA UFO PSYOP versus real UFO disclosure. And I want to say right at the outset, you know, um, on this program, we've had the absolute best experts on the UFO file. Some of them aren't even with us anymore. But everyone from Jim Mars to Stanton Friedman, um, you know, the former defense minister of Canada, Paul Hellyer, Linda Moulton Howe, um, you know, the people who were deep, deep into it for years, uh, David Jacobs and others. So I'm coming in from an angle not of debunking UFOs at all. The centerpiece of the UFO file, you know, of the X series is the UFO file. So therefore, what we're trying to do is show you the two tracks, the one track of the actual UFO file research and then the CIA circus dance with all the money and hoopla and Grush and Elizondo, all that stuff. That's a totally fake version of ufo disclosure that's the thing we're exposing here on this show so there's two tracks there and so getting that in mind sometimes people will say well you know you're debunking the cia disclosure aren't you debunking ufos doing that no because you don't want the false reality around a thing you're going for the truth after all otherwise what's the point you know we don't want to be pawns in somebody's intel game you know 
<laughs> we have enough of that going on as it is. So uh, if anything, what we want is the hardcore truth around the UFO file. And it does include an incredible, incredible mystery. And at the heart of that mystery, you guessed it, is X technology and X steganography. That's the core uh, around so much of this. So when we get into advanced technology, when we get into lost chapters in history, and when we get into the development of this wall of secrecy around the UFO file, we're getting dangerously close to uh, that deep state control mechanism that we're living under. That's the nature of the problem with putting forward the real thing versus the CIA sideshow. Because the CIA sideshow, if you track it, which we have on this program, you can see everyone, and I mean everyone involved, in launching this version of disclosure <laughs> the CIA version it came through the New York times. It came through a bunch of CIA and Intel people like Elizondo, like Mellon. And, um, this whole thing has been arranged by these people about this stage with this real heavy push on July 26th. Um, recently that we covered, they've, they've run into trouble in the last week because the guy they put out there as their point man has some very unusual things and a very strange psychological history. Um, and that for sure is uh, something, you know, they've been doing all these protective things around Grush. Oh, you can't talk about him because, oh, maybe he's autistic. Well, they came up with that now as a reason not to discuss this person uh, and the incredible things he's saying about, you know, alien bodies and all this stuff. Of course, it's all NRO, CIA seeded uh, information. So uh, now the next thing is now that a, a reporter went and got uh, some FOIA information on this whistleblower Grush and showed that he's had psychological issues, uh, now the next thing is, oh, you can't talk about that because no. When the CIA goes to run a false UFO uh, threat program and it tries to use and induce the mainstream and the independent media to do it, you're going to get serious truth. And if you put yourself on the eight ball right in the center of that, you are going to get a lot of exposure. You might as well be taking a shower in public if you're going to be doing that. Mm. So if Grush didn't expect to get scrutiny, then the CIA people lied to him. And I'm sure they'll cut bait when the time comes with that situation as well. But let's get real. You know, this is investigative journalism. Investigative journalism is adversarial journalism. It's never personal. It can't be. But, you know, if you're going to expose things, and show the public who's a phony, you know, uh, and if the CIA is running a false UFO threat program with their money, then for sure, you know, you're going to get into people's backgrounds. This is all there is to it. And, um, you know, also what's interesting about this case is um, all the methods used for getting into the background of Grush were through FOIA. So if you have $250, <laughs> you could have gotten the exact same report from the sheriff's office. And so I'm going to get into that report and all the hubbub that's come about as a result of that with them trying to get the reporter who worked for The Intercept to apologize or something. It's like, no, you know, <laughs> he, he's just he, doing his job. He, he's doing his job. The other thing that's interesting for me about this is, you know, all the mistakes that News Nation is making in relation to it. Are, and they, they're letting this Russ Colhart guy run all over the place with all kinds of false narratives. And I'm going to expose him tonight as well, uh, because he was a deep state tool with what he was doing in Australia. I'm going to show some of that. And now he's a deep state tool here in this. So, you know, it's going to be the gloves are off on this one. Um, and this is the time really where the CIA narrative collapses. And that's where you apply the most pressure. Everyone, you're watching the Dark Journalist show. This is... Dark Journalist X Election 2024, the CIA UFO threat PSYOP. And uh, we're going to take your questions in the second half of tonight's program. It's a power-packed little presentation, but I think I can get through it and still leave you guys a, a good 45 minutes for Q&A. Uh, before I go any further, oh, of course, you can ask those questions of Miss Olivia anytime she's going to be putting those together. Mm -hmm. What do we got there? Dolores Green says, Dave on X-22 report says UAP disclosure will lead to the enhancement of a one-world government. Do you agree? Well, I think it's the goal... Um, of these organizations to get something that would give them the ability to run a one world government and the consolidation of an alien threat is the final idea, the final goal. 
the fact that they've been able to redevelop and um, have developed this technology in the background for 80 years unchecked, probably a lot longer. Um, and that the money has been disappearing out the back door this whole time tells me, as you know, I've been tracking it on this program, the alien threat aspect is the thing that they're relying on. And a lot of um, UFO researchers and stuff around this fell you know, on their face on the job in relation to pointing out the CIA threat when this thing came in um, with the to the Stars Academy and all that, you know, all they had to do was go half an inch deep research on it, and they were going to find TTSA was all CIA people and career CIA people. So uh, the intelligence agencies were running this, and the deep state had a you know deep interest in getting the media on board about this. the The level of sinister activity on it runs deep now. Again, for the record, you know, this show is, is based on the idea that the UFO file is real. <laughs> That's why uh, in my own life, you know, I've, I've worked uh, around the subject for years. When I was 19, I met John Mack. My friend was, was his assistant. So, you know, that I've been reading this stuff since I was a kid. And, you know, it's just part of the thing that I understand that I've always been trying to ferret out the reality in the background. So many of the people coming into this, whether it's News Nation or The Hill or whatever, they don't know anything about UFOs. And uh, this is tough because you get a halfway decent journalist. Um, Glenn Beck actually did a show with Schellenberger, who I've pointed out before, although he did good things around COVID, he's too naive. He just got into the UFO thing. He did two articles on it. And then he was like, you wouldn't believe it. All these Intel people showed up and they told me where the, you know, the crash UFO landings where they took the artifacts and we can go lead a march to area 51, you know, <laughs> I, so they just don't get it. You know, the, the CIA controls the UFO file. They have no desire and they have no interest in sharing that with the public. They're an organization that is steeped in deception. That's what they're good at. It's what their job is actually. And they've never been known to share anything with the public, you know, least of all something like this, which, held in corporate hands or represents a gigantic scientific advantage. So there's a terrible, terrible naivete on one hand, and then a lack of, uh, you know, being informed on the other. So it's, it's very tricky in that way. So I'm going to go through this timeline. So anybody going through this, if, if they watched the previous episode we did, if you put that episode together with this one, you're going to know everything there is to know about this year <laughs> and what they've been putting out there. Um, because this year they decided right from the beginning with the Chinese balloon and the UFO shoot downs to get the COG emergency powers piece going with NORAD commanders shooting down UFOs and then to roll out this whole Grush op by the way, in the middle of all this, they haven't mentioned anything about the secret space program. You notice that? They're just talking about, hey, did you know in the 1950s stuff crashed? <laughs> I mean, you know. As if they'd been sitting on it, doing nothing. Yeah. And here's the other thing. I mean, think about the secret space program. How much information have we brought forward about that? It's a gigantic program, totally missing. You know, you don't hear Burchett or Luna <laughs> talking about those things. And um, the two of them when faced with the fallibility of Grush, came forward and were like, the CIA is after him. They leaked those records. And they were quickly proven wrong, but they didn't go online and say, oh, we were wrong. So everybody, you know, all these people came forward, including News Nation, and they had to come back and say, oh, this was all, you know, we were wrong about the whole thing. The records were publicly available. All you needed was a FOIA request. When I looked into it, you know, the FOIA request was 250 bucks. <laughs> so, you know, hardly a CIA operation for Grush. If anything, the CIA put Grush up to the job in the first place. So this is a very interesting thing. I think what happened is the CIA got wise to the idea that, you know, people like myself and others were really bringing on that idea of like, do you really want disclosure from the CIA? So they decided to make their whistleblowers, as I've pointed out before, the guys who are saying, we need truth from that government and that CIA, you know, when in fact they're all government and CIA people doing this. So let's get real. You know, those people have no interest in genuine disclosure. They're working on a job. This is their operation. So uh, in our minds, we can very easily separate the real 
um, UFO file research versus this phony CIA disclosure. That's very important, I think. Okay, let's start off with some unusual people. <laughs> Uh, whenever you get in the middle of all this and a real deep state player shows up, watch out. Uh, but it's very telling. In this case, it's our friend Charles McCullough, who is the inspector general of the intelligence community, the top legal spook who retired to join a law firm and then represent Grush, shepherding him through. Uh, he also had a long history with the NRO, which is where Grush comes out of. My guess is they spotted Grush a long time ago for this. Um, and then there's a few things about McCullough that are interesting, as I pointed out in the previous episode, you can go into it deeper on that one, but I'll just say here for starters, that he was the architect of the Patriot Act. <laughs> that's one. It's two, he was the architect of the Department of Homeland Security with Dick Cheney. That's who you're dealing with. And whenever we get around this phase, uh, we're dealing with kind of the nine 11 version of the UFO file. There is McCullough with James Clapper, that's from the DNI website because McCullough is Clapper's protege. If you go through his history in his own bio, they talk about how Clapper has mentored him through this and through that. Um, and, you know, this is very significant for the position that he's in now. Now, as I pointed out last week, um, you know, you have Lazar and Corbell in the middle of all this. They place themselves in the middle of it so that the scrutiny level around them you know goes up in relation to this but for some reason um you know knapp has sold himself into this after having a, a career doing kind of better work but he's gotten on board with this intel version of false disclosure and corbell latched on to him and now they make movies together and they show up behind grush during these congressional hearings during this um podcast that they do they're sitting there talking to cold heart and um, Knapp says something interesting about McCullough. He says that, you know, he was right behind um, Grush and he was telling him commands, answer this, don't answer that, and all the rest. Now, uh, true, he's his lawyer, but you would think in a normal setting, like if you look at normal government things, you have the lawyer sitting right beside the person and then they whisper things to them or whatever. This guy was really the puppet master. And that is the shot of him behind Grush. And there's a thing now going around. And I, I think I came up with it last week and it's the Grush head snap. Okay. <laughs> so the Grush head snap is the amount of times he turned around to get instructions from McCullough. Okay. So the head snap was on big time. Um, and I will say this, that um, the CIA the program around the UFO threat, when they, they get into it on this level, it, it gets ugly because you know, even the people that they use intentionally, they have something on. And in the case of this information that uh, the Intercept reporter got about Grush, you know, it's not pretty. It's not pretty stuff. So um, the, the CIA kind of thrives on this weirdness. And there's a kind of a gross feeling when you get in deep into an op uh, and the things that they run. There's There are vibes like that around 9-11 uh, the JFK assassination, the financial coup d'etat, there's this thing that is very much a signature of them, but it's in this expose. So I'm telling you that in advance because <laughs> it gets pretty dicey. So last week I put forward the proposition, me and my shadow, that's his handler. Um, and that's the architect of the Patriot Act and the architect of the Department of Homeland Security with Dick Cheney. Okay, that's where we're coming from here. Nothing to do with UFO disclosure, absolute deep state territory. So, you know, handled. Okay, we start there. Now, when they did the op and they, they came forward and did the whole thing, it was pushed around um, the UFO threat aspect and him saying, oh, I have all this information in the skiff I can give you and them pretending like, you know, oh, I can't believe it. You know, Tim Burchett being out there, the congressional leader of the uh, hearings it's weird they didn't even let him lead the hearings they pulled him and luna the night before interestingly enough but um what happened and i think it's very interesting is that he he laid out the red carpet and the two pilots that they had giving testimony ryan graves and um the other 
witness, it was very interesting to me because their stories were very solid, but whenever he got around Grush, things got weird and his story had to be exaggerated and he had to be kind of the center of this whole kind of wild tale. Now they needed people. And so they got outside support on this. Let me go through this again. So we get some foundation here. So we've got Grush. He's kind of the Bobo for the operation. We have Chris Cuomo. He's the one through News Nation and Next Star. We'll get into that, who needed to be the foundation for this. Chuck Schumer uh, announced, oh, we're going to do a JFK record style thing with the UFO file. I'm taking over <laughs> uh, that paragon of virtue. And then up here you have Avril Haynes, who used to be the deputy CIA. Now she's top cop DNI. And um, it's interesting because she was the deputy un under Brennan. And Brennan was known as the drone king. She was known as the drone queen because she had all these legal rationales for droning people. Um, so the CIA running the entire UFO threat program. Keep the people in mind as we go along. Uh, McCullough in particular shows up in a very important vein. Now, to recap and sum up on Grush, they have the top legal spook running Grush. That's the first warning sign. Two, he's the architect of the Patriot Act, and he is the architect of Homeland Security. That's a problem. That's a big problem. Three, he's the, the uh, protege of James Clapper. Okay. Um, everywhere we saw Grush in public, very close by was his shadow, the spook, legal spook, McCullough. Now, McCullough, uh, you know, <laughs> is something when you get these news reporters going through this stuff that they miss McCullough completely. And they're like, well, you know, Grush has all these people behind him who are high ranking and all this stuff. Look, <laughs> McCullough is high ranking, yes, but he's a deep state operator of the highest order. So if you're working on a UFO threat for the continuity of government to do the types of things you did with uh, security and centralizing things when you had the 9-11 event and came out with the Patriot Act, then that changes things, doesn't it? This is what's missed over and over again. So when they had this Glenn Beck segment with Schellenberger, it was embarrassing because he's sitting there going like, I don't know why the Defense Department would want to run a UFO threat or pretend, you know, like a PSYOP because they can get all the money they need from Ukraine. <laughs> and Ukraine comes up, you know, tonight and all, but that that is an incredibly naive thing. And this is where all the researchers need to stop and go back and look at the development of the UFO threat and what they've been up to here, because otherwise it's looking really bad about how the independent media gets their hands and actually uh, engages on this UFO file issue because it's gigantic the way that they're dealing with it and they're just pushing it out there and these people have no idea. And you have Glenn Beck and stuff. You know, what's interesting is the guy who I found with the most savvy on it was Alex Jones when I went on his program. He understood it really well about the nature of the false flag involved and what they were building up. So, you know, there are people who do understand it and uh, we're going to need more of that because this kind of whimsical podcast version of life doesn't exist, you know, and their idea that like, well, the government, you know, they, they might lie about certain things, but are they going to lie about aliens? <laughs> yes, <laughs> they are. Okay. Um, so what happened, I'm going to give you a timeline that shows you how we got to Grush. Now, in April, on Hitler's birthday, oh my God. <laughs> there was a meeting of all the top intelligence people, and it took place where? Don't know. Wright Patterson. Oh. Wright Patterson is known as the ultimate kind of UFO haven and it's where they've taken the craft uh, and where they've developed things that are completely off the books relating to advanced technology and the UFO file. And it's been that way. Uh, the reports around that since at least Roswell. Okay. So you're talking about a good close to 80 years there. All right. Hitler's birthday. Uh, these Ohio newspapers start coming out with these stories. Like all these Intel people are here. What's going on? Aliens among us. Top U.S. intelligence officials discuss UFOs in historic security briefing. Okay. Avril Haines, CIA Director Burns, more and more. The committee's chair, Representative Mike Turner, Republican from Ohio, and ranking member Jim Himes from Connecticut, Democrat, 
told reporters on Thursday that the event is historic and unlike previous briefings they had attended. Quote, I don't recall the committee ever doing anything like this. <laughs> Himes and Turner said the purpose of the retreat was to ensure that intelligence officials are knowledgeable of activities occurring at Wright-Patterson, which houses both the National Space Intelligence Center and the National Air and Space Intelligence Center, both of which will be among the items addressed during the briefing. Now, there's a big connection there uh, with Grush, huge Crush Cross. Other topics receiving attention at the briefing will be the Chinese spy balloon that passed over the U.S. in February, and so on, and so on it went. Now, that meeting caused a lot of curiosity, and people didn't know what it was about. What's going on at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base? Interesting to see such a heavy intel community presence at a meeting outside of Washington. There are reports everywhere. Intelligence community leaders meet at Wright-Patterson for historic behind the scenes um, working around these issues. Leaders from the U.S. intelligence community met in Ohio on Friday for an unprecedented national security briefing at Wright-Patterson. And there she is, Avril Haynes, the DNI. This is the same DNI who said, I think aliens are shooting at our ships. <laughs> All right. Uh, you don't get that kind of talk from intelligence officials. It's just not the way that they talk because they keep things behind the scenes. When she comes out and says that, she is working. It's, it's part of their operation to have this going on. All right. More. Some of the nation's top intelligence leaders started briefings and tours at an unprecedented Wright-Patterson Air Force Base retreat Thursday evening, a gathering that continues Friday. Drawn by an invitation from Dayton Congressman Mike Turner, CIA Director William Burns, Air Force Secretary Frank Kendall, National Security Director Nakasone, and more than half of the members of the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, which Turner leads as chairman, will visit or are visiting Wright Patterson. This was the setup for everything that happened after the fact. Afterwards, you had the hearing, which was the NASA UFO hearing. You had a UFO hearing in Congress. Then you had the Grush story come out. The Grush story came out through Russ Coldhart and uh, the crisscross of deep state operations, News Nation, and Coldhart. Okay. These participants will discuss intelligence and strategic planning. Avril Haynes, uh, Director of National Intelligence, said, we'll be doing a lot of discussions about what our plans are for the future. Indeed, Avril, indeed, you did. So um, that is what is the dovetail. Now, take us back. Do you have that time, time retreat music? <laughs> <laughs> Let's go back just a little bit to the beginning of the year and the strange Chinese balloon, which went across the country, sailing across the country as it never We've never had that before in our history. And um, we actually put rules in place during World War II because the Japanese had all these poison balloon bombs that they were sending off the East Coast to us, uh, the West Coast to us. And, you know, so there were already rules in place for that. The ridic ridiculous explanation on the part of NORAD, which I found quite extraordinary, was they said, you know, we, we didn't have any protocols because we were looking for big things. We didn't see those balloons. And uh, so all this time during the Cold War, the Russians could have just, you know, sailed across a nuclear balloon. That would have been the end, I guess. So obviously, um, they think no one's paying attention. But anyway, that's how we started the year. And it got weirder, right? There were unidentified objects over Canada, Alaska. And finally, they had a COG commander shooting down ufos that was the way the new york times put it he shot down ufos and um those articles become very important when you see that the continuity of government piece and the ufo file piece were moving in tandem but the ufo file piece was the one that was up front that was grosh and all the rest of it behind the scenes they were moving in this new cog commander who we're going to get on august 20th I'm going to introduce you to him tonight as well. Everyone, you're watching the Dark Journalist special report. This is X election 2024. Yes, there's an election component to this, the COG 2024 election, the CIA UFO threat PSYOP. We're going to be taking your questions in the second part of tonight's program. And before I go any further, Ms. Olivia. Okay, you're getting up? into this. A Baker wants to know, can you ask Daniel how the NRO fits into all this? I find that James Clapper was very connected to that as well. That's true. Um, well, we have main heavy-duty uh, people 
involved with the NRO. Grush, his legal handler there, the guy who wrote the Patriot Act with Cheney, McCullough, that's all NRO. Uh, NRO is interesting because the uh, National Reconnaissance Office, it is this structure that was in the government starting in 1962 and possibly even earlier, but we didn't find out about it in earnest until 1994. There were leaks that it existed in the late 70s, but as an actual organization, we didn't know about it or its activities in relation to space, satellites, spying, until 30 years later. Now, they could be very much involved in doing the same thing now. There could be a whole UFO office that we know nothing about, and then later down the road we'll be like, oh, they had this, and they'll have some excuse like, well, we had to keep it secret because of the Russians, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, but the NRO, therefore, based in secrecy, brought through in secrecy, birthed in secrecy, created in secrecy, grown up through secrecy, that's one of the most super secret organizations that you can imagine. Yes, the NSA is an incredible spying operation and spies on all our communications and keeps them at a location in Bluffdale, Utah. But the NRO, you know, has, hasn't had any government ac accountability for its first 25 years of existence. Keep that in mind uh, as we go along here. But um, all right, UFOs and continuity of government. Okay, this is the key thing that all these people trying to figure out you know, like Glenn Beck and Schellenberger and Weinstein and all these people, what they don't get is the COG connection to the UFO file. When they put those two pieces together, then you get the UFO threat, emergency powers, things start to make a little more sense. <laughs> so we'll give you some of those details tonight. Um, okay, U.S. Downs unidentified object over Lake Huron, third destroyed since Chinese spy balloon. Now here, during that press conference, as I've pointed out, the current COG commander, General Van Herc, who has a big Roswell connection because he's part of the 509th bomb group, um, which is kind of extraordinary as a signature. You know, obviously he came along much later, but still the fact that he's part of the same bomb group that found the Roswell wreckage is <laughs> significant. Um, so Van Herc comes forward and he, they ask him, what do you think it is? You know, do you think it's aliens? And he said, I'm not ruling anything out. So this was that step over the red line and all the headlines came out of it. NORAD director, you know, because the NORAD, NORTHCOM and COG commander, they're all the same position. And uh, he's a triple threat. And what happened was as a result of that, they floated this whole idea that they were shooting down UFOs. And then there was this whole thing about like, oh, whatever the wreckage was, we're going to show you the the videos and we'll tell you what it was. And then later they were like, Oh, you know, the wreckage disappeared and there's no videotape. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, there's no camera footage. Okay. Now keep that COG snapshot in mind. We go along and we find out that in May there was a kerfuffle, a deep kerfuffle <laughs> inside NORAD. And it had to do with Van Herc being replaced and them putting in place Air Force Lieutenant General Gregory Gillett. Now, he's going to replace him out of nowhere. This incredibly disciplined, decorated officer, General Van Herc, comes forward and he says, Space Command is deceptive. That's a big thing. That is NORAD versus Space Command. You get those guys fighting with each other, it's, then it's anybody's ballgame. But this was weird. And then he said, we're the ones who have charge of ICBM missiles. We're in charge of this. Space Command lied. And he's freaking out about all the things that he's in charge of. This guy, Gillett, who they're getting to replace General Van Herc, he comes forward and he says, you know what? I, I'm going to be the new COG commander. Here are the things that are on my tracking list. Cyber nuclear strikes that target the U.S. infrastructure. This is his first uh, introduction. Now, Lieutenant General Gregory Gillett, uh, he was the deputy commander for U.S. Central Command, soon to be COG commander. Biden taps Air Force's Gillett as new NORAD commander. 
President Joe Biden nominated Air Force Lieutenant Gregory Gillett to add a star and succeed General Glenn Van Herc. Now, Glenn Van Herc is only 54 years old, I think. So, you know, <laughs> this isn't retirement age, but they're retiring those COG commanders fast. Uh, and the Department of Defense also formally announced General Charles Brown Jr.'s nomination. Gillett, a battle manager by training, is currently deputy commander of U.S. Central Command. Now, they got the new guy coming in August 20th, okay? But here's the thing. When, when was Gillett confirmed? When was his confirmation hearing through the Senate? When did all this come up? Senate hears combatant commander nomination. And he sat before these committees and answered questions. It's the very same day that Grush gave his testimony. We have Commander Gillett out there talking, Lieutenant General Gillett, and he's doing his whole shebang literally hours after Grush gives his crazy wild ride testimony with McCullough behind him prodding all the answers. July 26th, it's a very interesting date for the COG commander to be confirmed while they're launching the UFO threat through Congress. Unbelievable timing, but it's going to go even deeper as far as timing goes. Um, so now let's fast forward to what happened. So we know that Grush got on there. He pumped us all this stuff through News Nation. There's an interesting thing there with News Nation. News Nation special on UFOs beats LeBron James's CNN series and ratings. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we see that there's a huge initiative here on the News Nation part to get ratings. And so they'll literally push anything. Um, but in this case, the heavy, heavy duty nightly shows around the UFO file using all the same characters, the deep state operators, Cold Heart, Grush, and all the rest of it. Uh, that's a way to keep control of a thing and track it through these programs. And they're doing it outside of the protocol and even the scrutiny of their puppet media, like the Washington Post and the New York Times. And they're saying, maybe we can, you know, have more plausible deniability doing it this way. All right. Now, in the middle of all this, we get somebody who uh, looks into the past and the background of Grush. Now, Grush uh, himself came forward with the story that he had heard all of these things about alien bodies and he knew where all of these craft were being stored. This is the same thing that they told Schellenberger, if you recall, but this was even deeper. And it's funny because, you know, Schellenberger gets into the UFO file for two months and all these Intel people, he's like, Hey, it's great. You know, all these Intel people called me and told me that this thing is really true. <laughs> well, that's the first, that's the first dead sign. You know, that's the dead giveaway that, Whoa, you know, you're in trouble. Never listen to Intel people. <laughs> Start there. All right. So Burchett and Luna say we're running this thing because of Grush's incredible testimony on News Nation. And uh, so the News Nation story comes out. Of course, Grush presented no data to analyze, nothing. It was all hearsay, and it was all him saying, hey, the inspector general of the intelligence community is behind me. Well, Luna, as I've pointed out here, who's the congresswoman from Florida, is very interesting because um, she has a background with the Air Force, and now she seems to have some kind of a thing to get answers out of the Air Force. Burchett, uh, they have him playing conspiracy man. Basically, you know, there isn't a conspiracy he doesn't love. And when this all came forward about Grush and the intercept story on him and the fact that he'd had these incidents, um, you know, where he had threatened his wife and acted crazy and been put in a, a psych facility. Um, it was Burchett who said, whoever released that, and, you know, he, he would swear in his tweets and stuff like that. It's really weird activity on the part of a, you know, supposedly professional congressman. And then Luna fell for the same thing and said, oh, the CIA leaked this. You know, we're going to get to the bottom of it through the Air Force. <laughs> so as it turned out, uh, no. Uh, they had to retract that, and News Nation did retract, it, and they said, you know what, actually, it was just a regular FOIA request that anybody could have got through that sheriff's office. So um, they had to eat some crow there, 
And but that didn't last too long because what they decided to do was to keep pumping up the idea that Grush was this victim and that the intelligence community was going after him. Remember again that it is the intelligence community that's putting him forward. So this is the way the CIA works. Oh, he's a victim. They'll use their own lack of popularity and the, pa the fact that people are suspicious of this agency as a way to say, oh, let's pretend here that the CIA is after him and he'll have a kind of a plausible deniability. And uh, when in fact he's their guy, because again, all the people that he was in NRO with, they're all CIA people honeycombed throughout the organization. It's all theater. It's all theater. Now, interestingly enough, the actual article that came out through The Intercept is pretty wild. UFO whistleblower kept security clearance after psychiatric detention. The star witness of Congress's UFO hearings, David Grush, retained his clearance despite alleged substance abuse issues, FOIA documents reveal. That's the story. And, um, you know, this is what we're talking about. This is the story that got all of this negative attention from News Nation and all the lies from Burchett and Luna and everybody else. No, it wasn't the CIA that leaked the story. This guy paid the 250 bucks to get the FOIA request. All right. Uh, anyone could have done it. He just had the ability to do it. That's another thing issue I take up uh, as far as Schellenberger goes. Where's that? So, you know, because if you're going to talk about UFOs, you're going to get called out. It's nothing personal. Uh, are aliens and UFOs a government psyop? That was the Glenn Beck episode with Schellenberger. And Schellenberger said, I will tell you, I've looked high and low, and this guy, Grush, is a Boy Scout. I can't find anything negative on him. Well, you could have done just a small search of his personal records that this other guy did through FOIA and found all this other stuff. So you didn't search very hard, Schellenberger. You were too busy listening to a bunch of CIA people tell you falsehoods about crashed UFOs and where you could get them and how you could lead a march to Area 51. Okay, that's, you know, this is all fantasy stuff and it's what the CIA are good at. But this whole kind of naive field around this needs to wake up and, and get on with it because the UFO threat thing in the meantime is being put into place. All right, a few good snippets now from this article. And um, I think it's important also to point out, let's see if I kept that headline here. Um, Miss Olivia, why I find this? Why don't you give me something to answer? Uh, Hyperion says, is this all high political theater or does DJ think they were actually briefed in a skiff? And Daniel Foster says, DJ, what can Congress do to have Grush speak publicly if no skiff is forthcoming? Um, what do you think was actually revealed in the skiff? Well, the skiff is just a smokescreen. First of all, if you have a congressional hearing, then the skiff isn't necessary <laughs> because the whole thing is you're under oath, you answer questions. Now you could say, oh, you know, you could get this is whole Elizondo's thing. Oh, I'll violate my NDA, you know, and all the rest of it. Look, if if you have whistleblower protections like this guy does, he should be able to speak freely, freely about these things. Now, the fact is that they've said now he lost his clearance and that's why he couldn't get with everyone in a skiff. Then afterwards they said, no, he still has his clearance. So there's a lot of crisscrossing here and there's no real answers, you know, so Here's a real journalistic question for Grush. One, were you put up to this? Two, do you still have a clearance? Yes or no? Don't wait for a skiff. Don't wait for the translation. Answer the goddamn question. So, you know, the problem is there's all of this, you know, the cold heart type thing. Then those types of questions are all like, you know, I'm scared, you know, and all this kind of stuff. That is theater. And they want to drag this thing out. They want the unanswered questions. They like the sloppiness of it. I do not think that they like the fact that this guy got the information on Grush this early. I think that this is something that got missed in their system. They had known that Grush had this weakness, of course, in his past. And look, if this were a legal case, and this guy comes forward and says, you know, I know all about these aliens and ships and everything else. The lawyer for the opposing team to get to the truth would ask him about his mental state and if he had anything in his past that would call that into question. And when questions like that came up in the Cold Heart interview on News Nation, Grush said no, which was a lie. But in the actual, uh, you know, taped interview, as we found out, 
he did tell him, oh, yes, I did have these issues and I had these psych issues and all this, but not in the one that was released. In the one that was edited and kept, they had those answers ready in case it came out and then he addressed it there. But in the one that was put out when he asked him, do you have any issues? He said, no. So that's a lie. And it's cold heart and grush lying there. So whatever else people want to say, you know, oh, he's a victim, all this other stuff. Look, he's lying on camera. All right. And that's CIA uh, trained lying. All right. So let, we have to get kind of clear on who you're dealing with there. But let's get a little bit into the Intercept article and what this guy was putting across. Um, Non-human biological material recovered from purported UFO crash sites, a decades-long secret program to reverse engineer extraterrestrial aircraft, a government cover-up employing administrative terrorism to silence truth-tellers. These are some of the extraordinary claims made to Congress by Major David Grush, a 36-year-old retired Air Force intelligence officer. Now, all of those, all of them, are memes that come directly out of the UFO community. Long-standing since the 1940s and 50s, in fact. But you have the whole thing about people being silenced, which is true. So what they're doing here is he's recycling all of the top points of the UFO field and regurgitating them along a kind of a marketing line. You know, if it was a marketing grid, he's checking the boxes on it. Um, so as we went along here, we find that um, this journalist came across <laughs> in looking for it he found some background on Grush and things that have gone on with him in his past. So what he found was um, security clearances, this is from the article, of the sort Grush has held are subject to strict requirements, including regarding psychological episodes and substance issues. Grush has used his high-level clearance to shore up his credibility, telling the committee, I was cleared to literally all relevant compartments and in a position of extreme trust in both my military and civilian capacities. I want to say something about Grush's testimony before Congress also. Uh, he claims that there's nothing above top secret. Anyone in that world, any researcher or any intelligence person can tell you, of course, there are categories above top secret. So Grush is shading the truth throughout his testimony. Uh, police records obtained by The Intercept under the Virginia Freedom of Information Act reveal that on October 1st, 2018, Grush was committed to a mental health facility based in part on a report that he made a suicidal statement after Grush's wife told him he was an alcoholic and suggested that he get help. The actual complaint says husband asked complainant, his wife, to kill him. Okay, so, you know, as I said, when you get around the CIA thing, the, the details get pretty ugly. Um, so there's this whole thing about him being angry and, and all the rest, and then they have to put him into uh, a facility. So... Uh, his psychological state of mind has come up in complaints in 2014 and 2018 um, show an instability there based on these reports. Therefore, um, highlighting that or contrasting that against his testimony about aliens and all this kind of stuff is relevant. <laughs> and there's no way in hell that it's not relevant. And there's no way that if you're a real researcher, you're not going to talk about it. It's absurd. Of course, it's relevant. And of course, his state of mind is relevant uh, when it comes to something that would be history changing that he's claiming before the Congress. Now, uh, does it mean that everything that Grush says is a lie? No, but if you think about it, the entire operation, the way that he's being brought forward by intelligence spooks to tell this big story, mixed with the fact that he has this in his background, makes it look exactly like the House of Cards that we said it was when he first came out. Now, you could have genuine, again, they, they like to mirror things. You could have genuine whistleblowers who want to tell the story about things that they've seen, et cetera. This isn't it. <laughs> uh, and I think that's the important thing for us to keep in mind. One last thing I will say in relation to this article um, is that Grush came out with a statement and he didn't say, you know, sorry, I didn't mention this. <laughs> He was basically like, you know, it was a lot of that talk of like, you know, people uh, in the military go through PTSD and all this kind of stuff, which is true, but isn't really, that's not really what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is the psychological state of the person bringing forward these fantastic claims, which of course are going to get real journalistic scrutiny if real journalists work on it. <laughs> 
but instead, you've had all this fluff around it to start with. You've had congressional fluff, CIA fluff, media fluff. And now a journalist gets some background on him and everybody gangs up on the Intercept guy. So um, what happened... Uh, oh, were you going to say something? Well, I think this is really interesting. I can't help but think, you know, you look at Greta and you see yes. child abuse. You look at Biden, you see elder abuse. And you're looking at Grush. Why are they choosing these people who are so easily, easily uh -huh. abused, victimized, uh -huh. and so that anybody who goes after them uh, is called a bully and mean and all of this? Oh, well, that is a very important point, which mm -hmm. is insulating them. And what they were originally saying they were going to do and um, it was Coldheart after the original criticism came out and said, uh, Coldheart came out and said, it's easy to go after someone's personality who has autism, you know? And so they were going to use that originally. And they backed off that. They were like, this thing's better. <laughs> um, but no, you can't. Once you put yourself on the bullseye for that type of information, you know, like I said, the, the nature of uncovering that the source of that information, if you become the person who's presenting it, then, you know, it's the equivalent, as I said, of uh, taking a shower in the middle of a busy street. You know, that's just the nature of real journalism to get to the bottom of a story like that when you make a tremendous claim about alien technology and everything else. So, uh, and his claims qualify as high drama on all this because they're so steeped in analysis around the genuine UFO file. And you have to separate out in your mind the CIA disclosure versus the real thing because the CIA will use anybody and they will, you know, kind of extort uh, any organization in order to get their purposes done. And if their purpose is a UFO threat, then this is what they're going to do. Everyone, you're watching the Dark Journalist Show. This is the CIA UFO threat PSYOP. Yeah, we're exposing some of the characters around this recent wave around it. Actually, they're exposing themselves. That sounds almost kind of X-rated, but <laughs> it is the X series after all. Uh, it's X election 2024. I'm going to show you how the COG piece gets right into the election that we're going into. We're going to take your questions in the second half of tonight's program. We're going to try to get through more of this, but there's a lot to get through. The last thing I want to say about the article is this. And, um, he has a piece here where he says the former colleague says uh, a former colleague of his expressed shock that Grush retained his clearance after the 2014 incident, not to mention the 2018 one, which was also documented in public records obtained by the intercept. You have two separate incidents where he had these, this huge break. Uh, I think it's like any insular group. Once you're in, they generally protect their own, said the former colleague who asked not to be named because they feared professional reprisals. The former colleague said that the 2014 incident was known to Grush's superior, a claim that Coldheart appeared to confirm in an interview on News Nation. The intelligence community and the Defense Department clearly accepted there was no issue because he was allowed to keep his security clearance, Coldheart told Chris Cuomo. Chris Cuomo went on these this binge not as a journalist, because we know he isn't one, but he went on this weird binge of protecting Grush. And that's weird too, because, hey, wait a minute, aren't you a journalist? Like, shouldn't you weigh out the different sides? No, it was everyone's after Grush, you know, and all the rest of it. Um, so News Nation took this position. Does UFO whistleblower's mental health story help his image? <laughs> They're like, this is a good thing, you know? Um, look, what's important here is that they didn't bring it up themselves up front. That shows the level of deception. The incidents themselves reveal something else, of course, a kind of instability, for sure. But the main point is the deception on top, is that he didn't say, by the way, yes, I've had these issues. He did say it to Coldheart, but he let Coldheart leave it out of the interview, and Coldheart left it out too. So they both lied to the public in relation to that. That's just on record. They're both liars. <laughs> uh, and then Chris Cuomo is doubling down, protecting the lie. But they got into trouble too, Nose Nation, around this because everyone was seeing, oh, wait a minute, you know, like <laughs> all the stuff that they're saying in relation to this, you know, that, uh, oh, one of the stories that came out was that um, the guy who wrote the story actually tweeted out, 
I've been, as a joke, I've been let go by the intercept and I've been let go to do even more work or something like that. And they took the first part of the tweet and they were like, he's been let go, you know, disgraced journalist, um, you know, going after poor old Dave. Now let's get into this a little bit and remember, um, the whole victim thing with Dave, this is supposed to be somebody who is a major and uh, can rank as high as a colonel in his civilian duties. Okay. So, you know, in general, <laughs> I've known military people. My dad was a military person. You know, it's not the kind of, they don't go run around looking for victim cover that, you know, that's just not the way it goes. So this guy, if he puts just the things, opposite, really. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if he's going to put things on the record, he's going to expect to be able to back it up. Um, so intercept obtained UFO whistleblower information through FOIA. This is the news nation retraction. The intercept published a story on UFO whistleblower health struggles. Reporter says he got information about David Grush through FOIA journalist, Russ Coulthard on news nation erroneously suggested records leaked by the government. You see how this works. So, uh, that, for the record, is how the collapse of the story of Grush played out. But what does it mean, and where does it go from here? That's the crucial piece for us to answer. And uh, just to double down on that, <laughs> the Daily Beast, which is one of the worst publications anywhere, but even they had to say about News Nation, News Nation awkwardly falls for reporters' tr Twitter prank. That's the level of research going on at multi-million dollar organization News Nation, which is running all over the place with Chris Cuomo as the new hero of the UFO file. Do you really want <laughs> Chris Cuomo? Uh, you know, this is what I said in relation to Gary Nolan. Do you want Dr. Fauci UFO disclosure? You know, so you have to choose. Not everything that says UFO has anything to do with the facts. And, and about 90% of the time it doesn't. And this is the nature of the problem with what we're up against, but the kind of collapse of the Grush narrative is very important because what they were laying out there was they had this guy and he was hitting all the CIA points and it was the whole, we need the truth from that government. We're going to open up that government UFO file. These were all government people, including the architect of the Patriot Act, including the architect of Homeland Security, ultimate deep state fingerprints all over the whole thing, including the fact that Grush's lawyer is the protege of, you know, uh, James Clapper and Dick Cheney. I mean, come on, do you get any more deep state than that? <laughs> Ask yourself the question. Um, so that gets us into interesting territory. Now let's go back again to the continuity of government program and see what this was really all about. Now remember, continuity of government is, is a very interesting program because a lot of people don't recognize the depth of it. There's only two researchers who get, uh, who've put enough research out there for us to go back to and look at. And one of them is Peter Dale Scott, professor of UC Berkeley, who's been on this program many times. Um, but what he put on the record is that over and over again, this organization is running without any oversight. And um, it seems that whenever there was a major event in American history from the Kennedy assassination all the way through to recent times, there's always a continuity of government person right in the middle of the entire event. In Watergate, it was John Dean who had just finished working for a COG, um, Oliver North in Iran-Contra, and uh, of course, Cheney and Rumsfeld during 9-11 all of the continuity of government activities, whenever there are deep events, 9-11, the JFK assassination, you've got COG people there, which means that super secret structure operates in such a way that they're able to keep that wall of secrecy in place. What does that remind you of? Well, the, the two super secret aspects going on in the government are the COG program and the UFO program. My uh, fundamental thought on this, and so much of the journalism aspects that I've brought forward around this have to do with the fact that if you don't put those two together, you don't quite get the nature of the situation. There's a reason why there's such an incredibly hot uh, geopolitical thing around the UFO file and its secrecy 
over decades. That's why the CIA kept it so under wraps. And uh, the number of things that have happened there, including the fact that President Kennedy was assassinated over the issue, give us some hint of the severity on their side of letting that secret out. This is something that they don't want to share and something which represents a huge, a huge advantage. Um, so, but for a very small group. <laughs> and um, essentially, the JFK assassination records and the UFO file hold somehow the weight of the ability to destroy the entire deep state structure. This is why the records have been kept with tons of excuses for six decades. This is why the UFO file has been ridiculed until recently. Before that, it was all X-Files music. And, you know, there were attempts at disclosure that I think were coming, of re oh, kind of side cited out the two different versions of this. One of them was the ex-protect group was protecting everything. And then the ex-share group who want to move the culture forward. And if you go back in time, the, the people represented there, like J. Allen Hynek, Thomas Townsend Brown, President Kennedy, you know, that's all ex-share. And um, the ex-protect group is so secret and all we have really are their traces and weird stories about the men in black and, um, you know, the, the amount of organizational control that they have is just phenomenal. And so that's really where so much of the story goes. So let's go and take a look at someone, uh, before we get to the, the rest of the COG piece, let's take a quick look at Colt Hart because some interesting things have come up about him as well. Now he put out a book, uh, called In Plain Sight. <laughs> and uh, this was interesting because this guy fell over a log and discovered UFOs in 2021 out of nowhere. He was a 60 Minutes journalist, but he got caught up in various scandals in Australia. And suddenly he knew the truth was out there. Well, I have a feeling that they needed somebody who could go through this, who had chops in the background having worked around news organizations, but was not really heavy on the scruple side. Shall we say. <laughs> uh, so stories from Australia relating to Colt Hart. Odd, TV journalist and ufologist, secretive report about Ben Roberts Smith. Now, um, there's a thing here. There's a lot of research around this Ben Roberts Smith a case that took place in Australia. But here's basically a summary. In Australian media over the last few years, there's been an ongoing battle between a decorated Australian soldier, Ben Robert Smith, and a journalist who accused him of murdering innocent people in Afghanistan and being a war criminal. Robert Smith was bankrolled by the billionaire head of a different Australian media organization into a defamation suit against the journalists who made the accusations. Last week, Robert Smith lost his case as further evidence was found and presented to prove he is indeed, um, in the opinion of, of this post, a murderer and a war criminal. Um, so that is a 2022 story relating to this case. Very unusual case as well. Um, part of the bankrolling included a famous award-winning journalist to create a counter-report to the documented war crimes to get BRS off the hook. Colt Hart was the journalist they chose. He did the report and argued on behalf of the war criminal. Um, so this is pretty interesting. That's the guy that they had in the middle of all this. So Colt Hart was on the payroll of uh, this person who was found guilty of committing war crimes. And what he was doing was basically creating these backstories for the person and trying to find dirt on the people who were accusing him, which everyone who covered the case found very unusual. Now, um, the court was told uh, that a Mr. Smith's barrister wanted Colt Hart to investigate exactly what nine journalists, Chris Masters and Nick McKenzie, planned to publish about Mr. Robert Smith. Mr. Robert Smith barrister Arthur Moses told Justice Abraham the report was to help defend the ex-soldier against a relentless campaign by a rival media outlet. But you can see this is kind of like the, a dirty thing. And um, the, the campaign to degrade his reputation would likely continue until the defamation trial ended, he said. 
The Cold Heart report was also designed to inform Seven West Media of the allegations so they could get legal advice, he said. Nine's lawyers are trying to get their hands on the Cold Heart report. This thing went underground, whatever it was that he collected on these people on behalf of this guy who went to jail for war crimes, saying it is an unusual thing that a journalist in a PR firm would conduct an investigation for a company seeking legal advice. This is a deep state signature. And now you have this guy who's like, I'm a big truth teller and all the rest of it. But here he is working to smear some journalists there to get dirt on them. And now he's out here saying, oh, you know, the CIA got dirt on this is uh, so dirty. <laughs> I know. Right. It is. I, <laughs> this is almost the dirty magical mystery tour. So uh, what's interesting for me when I look at this is the amount of people from the deep state who are sitting in the middle of all of it with everyone going, huh? Like, who is that? Cold heart uh, th in this weird case with Robert Smith from last year. Okay. That's really weird. <laughs> And he needs to answer for a lot of what he was doing there. And where's that report? Did it ever come out? Doesn't apparently from everything I've looked at, it hasn't come out. Uh, and what kind of background was he doing that he was getting paid for to smear these journalists who were going against Coltheart? Very, very strange. That's one. All right. Uh, then McCullough being the mouthpiece for Grush, telling him what to say, when to say it, being the architect of the Patriot Act, you know, we're swimming in deep state soup around this UFO file release and in the middle on the top you have you know fluffy podcaster people going like i don't know why the government would want to do a ufo threat you know and so no you know that whole apparatus needs to wake up and go back to basic journalism ask real questions if you're in the ufo field now then ask these guys real questions the first question are you still working for the government in any capacity even in a contracting capacity that's what no one asked elizondo so when Elizondo came out, I presented all the questions he should be asked and even invited him on this program, of course, which he'd never take. So instead, he went on shows like George Knapp, and Knapp would sit there and go, how do you want to be remembered more for this incredible you know, service you're doing for mankind? And he would let him say, well, I don't really think I'm a legend, George, but thanks for saying it anyway. And it was this whole ridiculous, weird, you know, uh, fluffing up of like each other. Yeah, exactly. And, <laughs> you know, the way I look at it, um, you know, that has nothing to do with anything, you know, like where's your data? Where's your facts? Well, on the record, Elizondo lied about running a tip. We know that right off the bat. So we put those reports out for years and, and all these people were like, Oh, Elizondo, you know, uh, he did all these things. He was under threat. The government was after him. I knew through my own research that he was working for the government. And I presented that on a number of different occasions. And then eventually he came out and said, yeah, I am working for the government, but it's not what you think. So he'd been working for the government the whole time. He wasn't a whistleblower. Crush is not a whistleblower. This is all a CIA arrangement. And I've put it out there. I've invited all these people on this program. They can have a gentleman's debate with me on it. They'll never come near the show because in just a few minutes, their entire thing will be unraveled. And, you know, the nature of this op is don't ask us any tough questions. Or if it's tough questions, put it in such a way that I can do a sidestep answer and that's it. Nobody does any follow-up. That's the nature of how they've run this UFO operation with News Nation, Grush, and the whole thing that we've witnessed over the past two months. But what's missed in the whole uh, kind of reporting around this and the, a lot of the confusion around it is that on Hitler's birthday <laughs> at Wright Patterson, the entire core of the intelligence community got together for what they got together because, okay, this stuff is, you know, we're going to try this part of the UFO op. What do you think? You know, here are the contingency plans, et cetera. I'm sure they talked about other things as well. But since they're at UFO Central at Wright Patterson, I think it's a pretty good <laughs> guess that they were talking about the UFO file in relation to this. Everyone, you're watching the Dark Journalist Show. This is COG election 2024. It's an extra report on the CIA UFO PSYOP. Now, UFOs aren't a PSYOP, as I've put forward before. No, we've covered the UFO issue deeply and the UFO file's real. And there's something uh, of a huge mystery there that a great many researchers 
who passed through this program over the years have tried to find real answers on trying to be honest with the public. This thing is a degenerate freak circus. And the CIA is famous for this and they will use people who have issues, marginal people, all kinds of bobos and everything else to get this across. And once that person fails, they'll move on to the next person. Remember Tom DeLong? <laughs> move it on, baby, right? Um, you know, so they'll move right along with whoever they have. Now, what's weird is they have these former agents coming out like John Ramirez and saying, oh, something big is coming in 2027, you know? So the UFO file will be here and we need to prepare the public and all the rest. So you're going to have, this, this is such an aspect for the 2024 election, that the presidential candidates, Trump and Robert F. Kennedy Jr. need to, and I mean need, to have a real solid position on the UFO file and utilize their extensive backgrounds. In the case of Trump, um, it's very interesting because now they're showing John Trump <laughs> videos before he gives speeches. And recently in Alabama, they, you know, did this five minute movie of John Trump's accomplishments with Tesla technology and all that. I mean, it is, we're right on the border of having this stuff come out and Trump is kind of, I think, laying it out there. Like <laughs> how many more indictments before I just spill on this stuff. And also what's interesting is Jack Smith. Uh, submitted twice this week that he made mistakes in the indictment against Trump. So are these things literally to say, we'll put you in prison, but we'll leave these loopholes as long as you get out of the race, then our loopholes will unravel our legal case. Because remember Jack Smith, uh, as I mentioned last week, has a terrible track record of prosecution of his cases. As a matter of fact, why would you bring in you know, this kind of relief pitcher who has a terrible record of losing games you know, when you're trying to nail the biggest target, the former president of the United States, it doesn't make any sense. Also, he's known, uh, and the legal judgments on his cases are very often, hey, this doesn't fit there. Like, you made that up. That's not a law. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we're in a weird uh, situation where there's a lot of theater going on. And interestingly enough, with Trump, I think we are looking uh, at the John Trump information being put forward there uh, on purpose. And that's good. We want to see more of that. We want to see more of that from the RFK Jr. camp who they're trying to censor and just slam uh, and marginalize and trying to make him look fringe and all the rest of it. He He's not going to be able to get by much further without really taking the gloves off on Biden because he needs to expose the fact, because it's good for the country to expose the fact that Biden is mentally incapacitated and can't run the country because the country is more important than any kind of party loyalty or a sense that you're attacking a candidate personally. So I would take the gloves off and completely uh, eviscerate the Biden regime and the fact that they're letting this person who's half with it run the country. You know, it's not good for anybody to hang around there in denial. So, um, but I think what's very encouraging coming out of Bobby Kennedy's camp is that he's really showing, look, you know, these guys are exploiting the Ukraine thing and uh, he's going against all the traditional points around this with his background on the COVID op and all the rest of it. There's a real transparency candidate right in our midst. And the question is, are we going to be able to wake up and really hoist this guy into the presidency? That's uh, the question that's going on. And, I think if we could wake up at the end of the day with RFK Jr. as the Democratic candidate and Trump, who's heading towards the Republican <laughs> nomination, then we have some possibility of moving that body politic back to constitutional uh, law in, in relation to this. Right now, we're outside, you know, we're, we're in kind of oblivion land and we cannot, there's no way America can survive another Trump, uh, another Biden administration. Yes. Uh, Max W. Little. So is Grush a sort of patsy? Yeah. Um, in a sense, you know, uh, there's a few things about Grush that right off the bat were disturbing. One is that it was all of the packaged points of the UFO field in one person. Two is the fact that a year earlier, he was at a UFO conference and he's surrounded by all the people uh, like he's being groomed 
and this is on the record that he was groomed by Elizondo. So the, the minute that Elizondo is involved, that's all CIA. So that, that was the problem, but also, you know, he had a different image and they made him over to make him more presentable and everything else. So the whole thing was disturbing really the way that they brought him up and then to have Knapp and um, crazy Corbell, you know, leading this whole thing and being right behind him during the hearings shows a marketing aspect as well. So that's a, that's a problem. Uh, a marketing piece right present there. And then in the middle of it, the Intel community chief spook. I mean, this is a pretty dicey arrangement. You can imagine genuine UFO disclosure would have been uh, very, very different. And so what we have is this freak show CIA version, which is always looking through a glass darkly. It appears like the thing, but then you realize it's exactly the opposite. These guys have kept the truth. They've been in existence now uh, for 75 years and they've kept all of this information uh, behind the scenes and they've worked through corporations to get it around presidents and everything else. So much of the battle between president Kennedy and the central intelligence agency is that they basically thought they ran the world. And president Kennedy said, you know, the president is the head of the government. And, you know, when it comes to the UFO file, you guys need to present to me. It doesn't work the other way around. So, um, we put a lot of things on record more about that. in the Kennedy UFO piece is going to come out because of the information that we're putting forward on it. When you get, um, into the 60th anniversary of the John F. Kennedy assassination, and there are no answers from the government that make any sense, you know, just the old phony Oswald story. Um, everyone has a cynical, uh, understanding about this so when we get into this late stage around the kennedy assassination and then you start to realize all this battle over the ufo file um it's going to have it there's going to be a tracking back by responsible people who deal with research and journalism to the original problem with the ufo file and the lengths to which this X protect group went to keep their secret and they kept it on multiple occasions um, but you know, we've presented those occasions, the UFO file and the Kennedy era, that's where they were initially exposed around what they were doing. And then it goes, the whole thing goes underground. And then again, with Nixon, there's that clash of this Intel underneath and the kind of, you know, the overt world, the overt government fighting against this covert thing. But the covert thing is all of these checks and balances and um they they're so in the kind of warp and woof of american society that from the banking level from the technology level from the political level you know um even a president has a tremendous <laughs> difficulty dealing with them and so someone like nixon played ball for so many years and then they had no use for him because he actually thought he was president after he went to china and, and did all these things doesn't work that way not with the expert tech group everyone you're watching the dark journalist show this is x election cog 2024 is that where we're heading cia ufo threat psyop uh and then the real ufo file what about that we're going to be taking your questions here shortly i'm gonna interrupt you right now i've yeah. got a really dark question to ask that sure. occurred to me um about why grush was chosen is it possible that if necessary he might be martyred sacrificed oh i mean i know that's you know i never question. i never think about anything like that because um you know uh it, it's it's my opinion that when somebody makes an extraordinary claim like that the only thing that matters is um where's the data for the claim that anyone can look through the fact that he was trained by an intelligence um, wing to come forward with this because they wanted to use him as the kind of trial balloon for how they would run this through the government. I think that their whole program ran into a snag with um, this Intercept article coming out. I don't think that this is part of the, the whole uh, ruse, but I do think that they knew that he had the weakness back there with this. And so as a result of that, everything that we see on unfolding news nation doing shows defending him 
pretending, oh, you can't say anything about Grush because either he's autistic or he has PTSD or something, you know, there, <laughs> there's some reason why you can't criticize him or ask him real questions. You know, the real reason is because he's part of a CIA front trying to move their version of false disclosure forward on an unsuspecting public. But now that public is starting to suspect <laughs> and uh, through asking the kind of questions like we're asking here on this show and in the ideas room, this is the type of conversation that I think drives them crazy because um, they expect people to get on the bandwagon, you know, and the, I think the TTSA thing really um, showed them that there wasn't a lot of discernment uh, in the UFO community. That probably made them feel good. They were like, oh, you know, the UFO community is a bunch of has been so you can just roll over good you know <laughs> and that's that's kind of where they got their false confidence from and i think the extent of the way that this works so if you generate a genuine ufo threat by getting people used to the idea that there are aliens and there's all this technology flying around us and it's hostile then you elect this ufo defense office which i've said on this program that senator gillibrand and senator rubio put together and attached to the National Defense Authorization Act, you know, then you realize the extent to which they are going. Uh, so they're attaching the entire military bill and holding it up a trillion dollars so that they can attach the UFO Defense Office to it. That's what they did. That's how they got it. Now they try to expand it out for 2024, but they already have it uh, as part of this. So They've already taken the steps. It's already too late to say, oh, there's not a UFO threat thing. The people in the government are great. They're just doing their best. <laughs> um, I would like people in the government to be great and doing their best. It's just not the case. And so, you know, my, my problem with the UFO field is that they've fed their, the people who pay attention to them by not raising alarm bells into the lion's mouth of the intelligence community version of disclosure. This is the nature of the problem. This is why things are getting weird here because the CIA is running the circus and the CIA, remember, as smart as they are, they're also, you know, they're known to be a little crazy and uh, some of the people that they choose tend to be, you know, uh, let's say less than discerning. So, you know, they'll use these characters and then they'll turn their back on it and move on to something else. You know, this is the nature of, of how they do it. And, you know, the Jack Rubies and the Oswalds and the other people just left to, you know, kind of take the blame for the things that they do. This is the nature of, of how they operate. Uh, I do want to point out something that Professor Scott laid out about the continuity of government programs. So we all get on the same page with this because there is some bastardizing of what COG is and what it means. We've done a number of programs on it and the, the interpretation that we're giving is fundamentally from the uh, Professor Scott version of continuity of government from his deep research around it. And then the fact that I've plugged the UFO file research into that. Professor Scott doesn't, you know, he does deep state research. The deep state people have nothing to do with the UFO file uh, people. And I don't blame them because, you know, the UFO thing, you have these types of, of things going on all the time. But the, the, kind of lack the deficit of knowledge in the ufo field about the deep state subject could be very costly this time around because you know the fact that those researchers don't understand the way that the government operates means you get this whole charade and it gets dangerous if they actually let loose the ufo threat idea i've pointed this out before which is if you thought the COVID op with its lockdowns and its dehumanization and all the rest was something just wait till they get to the UFO threat operation. And with the right type of sunshine on it, they'll never get around, they'd never get to it. <laughs> but if they're allowed to run like this, it'll be easy. Everyone, you're watching the Dark Journalist show, the XCOG election 2024, the CIA UFO threat PSYOP. We're gonna uh, do a quote here from Professor Scott about the continuity of government program. Um, here's a little bit about it. Remember. It's simultaneously called the Doomsday Project. The network they use is called the Doomsday Network, strange as that is, because originally it was meant to be a network that would survive in the event of a nuclear catastrophe. Think of how good that kind of internet was and must be. 
Um, now, they moved and developed the change for it, but the original idea for COG, of course, makes total sense, which is set up a secondary government so you'll survive in the event of a nuclear disaster. That's the Eisenhower-Truman thinking around it. That gets exploited out, and it becomes its own separate state, its own separate government, and that's the nature of a lot of the problems that we're having. So just a little background on that COG here from Professor Scott, and then we'll move on to your questions. How's that, Miss Olivia? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so there was a change that happened in uh, 1988. Its aim was significantly enlarged uh, for COG. No longer was it to prepare for an atomic attack but now is to plan for the effective suspension of the American Constitution in the face of any emergency, including the UFO threat. <laughs> the change in 1988 allowed COG to be implemented in 2001, which it was during the September 11th attacks. By this time, the Doomsday Project had developed into what the Washington Post called a shadow government that evolved based on longstanding continuity of operations plans. It is clear that the Office of Emergency Preparedness, OEP, known from 1961 to 68 as the Office of Emergency Planning, and then from 1982 to 94 as the National Program Office for Project 908. That's the trickiness, changing the names. Supplied a common denominator for key personnel in virtually all of the structural events I have discussed. JFK assassination, 9-11, Watergate, the whole bit. This is a long way from establishing that the OEP itself, in addition to the individuals I have discussed, was involved in generating any of the events. But I believe that the alternative communication network housed first in this Office of Emergency Planning and later Project 908 played a significant role in at least three of these deep events, the JFK assassination, Iran-Contra, and 9-11. This is the easiest to show in the case of 9-11, where it was conceded that the continuity of government plan of the Doomsday Project were implemented by Dick Cheney, the 9-11 Commission could not locate records of the key decisions taken by Cheney on that day, suggesting that they may have taken place on the secure phone in the tunnel leading to the presidential bunker, and was such a high classification that the 9-11 Commission was never supplied the phone records. My guess is that it was the COG Doomsday Network phone. Um, so... What, what's interesting there is you're dealing with an entirely separate structure, separate reality, which even a commission overlooking something like the 9-11 attacks and getting to the bottom of it can't get any answers about it because it's super secret. So who, uh, you know, who's doing oversight on the super secret people? This is the answers that we don't get in the public. However, that structure continues to get more and more bloated out. And the COG rules that are coming uh, through now, which are starting to change COG and upgrade COG, part of that includes a new uh, ARPANET type system, a separate, you know, talk about a doomsday communications network. This is a doomsday computer network. And of course they have one now, but this is a new one. <laughs> and these are the types of things that they're rolling out and getting training on. And we hear things about this all the time. Um, continuity of government never used to be spoken about. It was so rarely even indicated in the media. And there came a point in 2020 where, uh, I was seeing it everywhere. And remember I'd been doing reports and putting things out with interviews with professor Scott and COG. I think the first one we did was 2014 and, uh, you know, his own reporting on COG goes back to the 1980s. So, you know, to have this just be a casual term used, this is from 2020, Boston Globe. The U.S. has plans for continuity of government, but do they go far enough? <laughs> you know, shouldn't we lock people up even tighter? The good news is that the executive branch protocols ensure continuity of government in the face of mass casualty events. The bad news is that we have much further to go. This is when they were raising the prospect of replacing Trump through COG. And Nancy Pelosi was like, oh, I got briefed by COG. And then Trump himself suddenly got COVID and got through it. But <laughs> interestingly enough, when he was finished with COVID, fired the uh, defense secretary. 
So uh, there are a lot of interesting pieces there about COG takeover if they didn't do the election things that they did to get Trump out. So this is part of our history and it hasn't been dissected properly because you've got the J6 op on top of all these other things and then the push against Trump and then the, the hatred of Trump and then Stepford Biden and, and all those. But here's what actually went down. During that period in September and October, they were weighing with the new COG commander who had just taken over in August, taking over via COG. They had laid out COG. It was showing up everywhere, New York Times and everywhere else. Suddenly COG was the thing to talk about because like the UFO file, they were acclimating the public for what they may do with it. And um, now when you get to the continuity of government piece mix with the UFO file, this is the thing that we've tried to put forward. And it's, it's what can really uh, put in mind, you know, give us that kind of frame of reference to move forward on this. Think about this. If sitting behind Grush at the congressional hearing is the person who was the intelligence architect of the Patriot Act, um, that whole piece of the Patriot Act comes directly out of COG. It's Dick Cheney's baby. As a matter of fact, he went into the secret uh, facility there at Mount Weather and then came out <laughs> with the Ten Commandments of the Patriot Act, right? Now, if his intel liaison was McCullough, who is now Grush's lawyer, there's a direct crossover from COG Patriot Act to the UFO file. Now, this is the thing that we're dealing with. The science at the beginning of the year gave us the COG commander talking about through NORAD shooting down UFOs. And that was the whole weird Chinese spy balloon thing. Don't tell me that that was a normal <laughs> thing. That's a coordinated effort, the Chinese spy balloon. There's no question about it. Um, so COG got a test run there. What happens when you know we shoot down UFOs and then have the NORAD commander, who's also the COG Northcom commander, standing tall, not the president. That already laid the tracks. And I think the freak out of General Van Herc during the summer when he found out he was going to be replaced by General Gillett who's coming up on August 20th to take over continuity of government as the combatant commander, Northcom and NORAD. He's taking over for Van Herc. Uh, and this guy comes out of, um, you know, a, a Florida air force base that had tons uh, of UFO activity. So we're really looking at a fascinating mix of situations here, but the UFO file COG aspect these two coming together and in the middle of it the 2024 election and here we are this is in the middle of it where we find ourselves i have more to cover on this but i must get to your questions because miss olivia <laughs> has them ready and with that miss olivia i turn it over to you okay how much of this is a profit deal there's a lot of profit look you don't see all those congressional people coming forward and saying we've got to get that ufo truth you know <laughs> i've made the point before you know, show me something early on these people, articles maybe that they wrote about the UFO file, uh, something, you know, why are they all so interested in the UFO file all of a sudden? In Congress, you'll find waves of things, you know, like when the Telecom Act came in in the 90s, there was all this whispering going on in the background. You had all these people who suddenly became incredible advocates for the internet and everything else because they knew this was coming in. Now, uh, the UAP UFO thing, rebranding and all that, that's all CIA. And somebody in the background is telling all those congressional people, you need to be part of this because, you know, that's how you get Andre Carson talking about it could be intradimensional. <laughs> it's a congressman. It's like a 40 year congressman, Democrat. He's never talked about UFOs in his life. And now he's talking about interdimensional ones. I mean, come on. So, um, Things are getting very, very strange in relation to this, uh, but it's incredible. You know, the UFO Defense Office represents an incredible financial opportunity for endless war and endless consolidation of power. Why not? If you're the deep state working with that same Nazi mentality, remember the original Nazi Space Corps, the idea was what? It was control the things on the ground from above, from space. <laughs> so... 
I mean, now it seems like a worldwide effort, right? There's a lot of high-fiving going on, but somehow whatever arrangement was going on in relation to Russia, well, that didn't work out so well. <laughs> and they're a major spacefaring power with a lot of UFO file information. I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll just have a war with them instead. Um, and we'll try to isolate them. This is the nature of, of what we're actually dealing with. And I think it's, you know, crazy making, uh, certainly from a foreign policy level to have no peace plan. It's absolutely ridiculous. I had a story, um, uh, here, let's see, there's a whole Trump piece here, but, um, here it is. Biden asked for 20.6 billion for Ukraine is counteroffensive sputters. <laughs> well, at least the New York Times admitted that it was sputtering. That's a first. Uh, we need more money, you know, to make Lockheed Martin richer and to pay off our friends and to have more Ukrainians get killed against a Russian army they can't beat. So there's a psychosis, um, and this is all the Biden administration and the control on the Biden administration. I'm telling you, uh, you know, it should be the job. And I know a lot of people laying on the sidelines in relation to the election. I don't recommend that because there's a lot of like, oh, the president doesn't matter. Let me tell you, we have to remove the Biden administration because the Biden administration is moving us towards a precipice in too many different areas. And if we don't restore some aspect of even imperfectly uh, of constitutional government, then there's not going to be anything to discuss in relation to it. So that means RFK Jr. has to get in on the Democratic side and Trump has to get in on the Republican side because both of them uh, have some understanding and respect for the Constitution. The way that things are going, um, the Democratic side, if, if there's a health issue um, or if there's really something that breaks on the Biden side, they're ready to replace him as the candidate. There's no question about it. But I would also say that I think their preference would be to hold on to the presidency and this drag that, you know, Biden is a corpse uh, over the threshold and then replace him with whoever they selected as vice president, who I don't think will be Kamala. So um, I think it's unfortunate all around. It's a terrible image worldwide. And, you know, this spectacle of this uh, elderly man who doesn't know where he is running the country while there's a committee behind him uh, really ruling the roost and we don't know their names and they weren't elected. You know, this is, this is a terrible situation for us to be in. And uh, on a humanitarian level, it's painful to watch uh, Biden stumble around. There's no question about it. Yes. Metakwe Oyasin, uh, does DJ think the UFO operation will be used as the reason to call COG, hence no election if they see someone they don't want winning Trump or RFK Jr.? I think that they, uh, they almost used COVID for that in October of 2020 with Trump. So yes, <laughs> the UFO file, I think, look, they don't want to spring the UFO threat when they're not fully ready and fully consolidated. Okay. Part of running Grush through there and having them talk about legacy programs and all this stuff is so they could give you kind of 1950s disclosure of like, we found a craft somewhere and hide the 80 plus years of development that they've been doing around the UFO file. Now, um, there's a lot of things coming to a head around this, including the fact that Russia is also fed up with uh, the things that we're doing on the world stage, and they may reveal the UFO file on their own. Part of our plan, part of the, the Grush push, you know, and the intelligence handling puppetry of that in front of Congress um, could very well be that we're afraid that the Russians will reveal it first. So... Um, they want to reveal their CIA version, you know, this phony disclosure. And you're hearing weird things in Russian media. Well, I mean, this was last November that I saw this headline. But they were talking about shooting down UFOs uh, who were coming into Moscow. That was coming out of Russian media. Meaning to the Americans, hey, we're going to just start calling it what it is. How do you like that? And I haven't seen them do that recently, but um, I heard one of their foreign ministers talk today and it was something along the lines of if NATO moves troops uh, into Ukraine, you know, the 40,000 troops they're talking about moving there, then it will be World War III. This is what the Biden neocon group.
group that the neocons worked through the Bush administration. They pumped up um, Obama dramatically. Obama bombed seven countries, you know, destroyed Libya. <laughs> and it was a dismal record. And, you know, in the meantime, he got a Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, there's going to have to be a huge revision around the things that took place there. But that neocon group doesn't care about party. You know, they'd create an independent party if they thought, you know, we can get in through that. But they've been going back and forth between the Democrats and the Republican. It became so strange. And many uh, Democrats saw this kind of, you know, invasion of the body snatchers thing where all of their policies became warlike. And, um, you know, the Democratic Party was known as the kind of, you know, the doves. And they were always criticized for that. Like during the Reagan era, anyone, you know, everyone was a coward to the Soviet Union and Reagan was standing tall against them and all that. So it's very strange. And the Democrats took the losses to keep their, you know, kind of dignity and, and to keep the beliefs that they held important. Now, you know, you have MSNBC being like, we have to bomb the hell out of Russia. You know, I mean, it's crazy, right? But this is the nature of how those neocon forces work. And there's such a deep, deep trench in the UFO field for the neocon thing. That's why you see Rubio there. And the Rubio Gillibrand thing is a whole neocon uh, control of the UFO file. They want an enemy, you know, and uh, that's how they're going to get it. Yes. Good time to ask this question. Jimmy Lyle Kenner, DJ, with the spirit of Armin coming down on us, is it fair to say people get more evil and more crazy? <laughs> is that what we're experiencing here? I Yeah. I mean, I hope not, but yes. Uh, it does. I think what happens is there's a kind of a thinning of the veil, and sometimes the thinning of the veil is simultaneously good, <laughs> but it's it's loaded with different types of possibilities. So there is that thinning of the veil uh, toward that mystical reality. And so it offers opportunities for, um, you know, almost Arthurian <laughs> legendary uh, actions to take place. And uh, we're going to see those, but it also offers the opportunity for the Mordred <laughs> mm -hmm. types of forces. And that's where the Aramonic thing comes in. It is quite a mythical period. There's no question about it. And um, you know, I mean, Star Wars has nothing on this, right? Uh, I have a quote, though, since we're going into deep territory there. And it has to do with a lot of people have been asking me, you know, has anyone ever talked about these different alien types? It is very significant to me that um, the types of aliens that have come up, that they're there are categories of encounters and some of those encounters are, you know, the Pleiadian Nordic kind of mystical angel types. And then the grays who really don't make a whole lot of sense. Um, unless you are talking about something that's on the transhumanistic type level, but I went back to, you know, we're going to be doing an episode on uh, the transcenders and challenges of change, but I went back to some of that material for this, for him to talk about, you know, and he's like an Edgar Casey style trance, Rick Thurston, the late Rick Thurston, who I was lucky enough over a six month period to have some significant conversations with. And I recorded everything that we talked about. Um, but I, th I think he had some very important information. I think the important information that's in the public domain on the mystical side now is the work of Gigi Young around the UFO file and around the mystical aspects and the periods and tying that into the eighth sphere information. Now, you know, there's a whole um, cosmology inside her work, which connects these uh, things. But um, I think that uh, the transcenders had something here. Here's something they're getting questioned about Albert Bender, who was the first person who brought forward all these UFO themes, interviewed witnesses. And then he got scared off by the men in black and he was a real, a researcher in the early 50s. So they're asking him, you know, what what about these stories that Bender told, you know, like of meeting these beings and stuff. These are the answers of the transcenders. So I'm just going to do a little aside here. Um, 
Bender wrote about strange aliens he had witnessed who had traveled many light years from their planet. Bender stated that these aliens claimed to have three sexes on their planet, male, female, and a third of neither sex, who were the exalted ones, the leaders. The transcenders said, the only ones that have a three-sex concept is the zeta reticuli, but in this case, again, we see the botes, the greys, feeding Bender false information. Now, um, the transcenders referred to the greys as the botes, and that is a star system. So just keep that in mind as we go forward. Uh, so the question is, Bender also writes that he had visited their base of operations in the Antarctic and that he had seen a spaceship garage and finally came face to face with the exalted one. <laughs> a nine foot bisexual with the same shining eyes as the others. The creature told Bender that they'd been visiting Earth since 1945. What is your comment? And here's the transcender's answer. Now that is the bote is the greys again. The very large botes, the non-sex concept, are basically cloned. And in the cloning process, they don't have a sexuality because basically, over time, they have lost it. They are pure clones. They are not bisexual concepts, male or female. The normal botes, greys, are much like you have depicted in your books and movies. They're about four feet tall, grayish complexion, large hairless heads, large black almond-shaped eyes, small slits for mouth and nose. The larger creatures Bender writes about are pure clones. Um, and there's so much, you know, we're going to get into uh, Thurston and some of the Transcenders work. And we've done some shows on them, but uh, I think this is interesting of the idea that there's a deception going on and that part of the deception revolves around cloning. Um, I think that that is going to be something important that's going to lead us as a concept to interesting, very interesting places. And I wouldn't be surprised if part of the dead alien thing that Grush was trying to bring forward, remember, there's a real legitimate UFO file dealing with the stories of actual crashed occupants, crashed saucers, and things of this nature. That part is based on actual cases and actual testimony. I'm going to read one tonight that comes from classic literature. But uh, so that's real, in my opinion. But the thing that they're going to bring forward, maybe they've gotten good enough to engineer a phony being at this point using half cyborg stuff and half human cloning. And maybe they were going to present this and be like, hey, here's a dead alien and Grush gave it to you. And the CIA version moves in and then you have changes to the human origin story and all this stuff through the CIA, nothing to do with the actual <laughs> reality. Um, that's what that's the danger in the way that Grush, thing, you know, the way that, that whole thing had been pushed out by the CIA. Um, so I think when we think about clones and the ability to clone and deception around cloning, we're getting into territory that is going to be fruitful um, <laughs> going forward. Since I mentioned another quote before I get to your next question, this is from a hard, very hard to find book. Now, a lot of people know Frank Scully from Behind the Flying Saucers because it's such a classic book and it brought so many things forward about the Aztec UFO crash, which uh, Scott Ramsey and his wife did an incredible um, series of books on the Aztec crash, and they're working on a new one, um, but they have a lot of information that is so pertinent to the things that are going on now. In any case, there's a strange uh, you know, kind of biography of his life, and Scully is a very interesting character. The book is a rare book. It's called In Armor Bright, and uh, it took a while to get it, shall we say. Um, now, something that's very important to listen to and then remember in terms of the testimony we hear being bandied about now. In 1950, uh, he talks about hearing a story about, we heard of a young man who gave a talk at one of the service clubs in Glendale, California. He repeated he had worked on grounded flying saucers. 
quote, not the ones Scully reported in his book. I'm familiar with them too. These were different. A bank president who had been at the lecture told us the young man's name and said he was a civilian specialist attached to the army ordinance. When we contacted him, he promised he would come and tell us what he knew. When he arrived, however, he seemed as if recovering from shock. The first thing he told us was that he was ordered not to come and talk to me at all. He couldn't very well show such bad manners after making the appointment. And he said, so I'm coming to tell you, I can't talk. He seemed dreadfully scared. To us, this seemed incredible, especially in America. To warm him up and get him over his fright, Silas Newton, George Smith and I, and Silas Newton is the kind of Howard Hughes type who tipped off Scully the, uh, about the original case of Aztec that got the whole book craze going behind the flying saucers. I began talking so indiscreetly about things we had done, which were verboten, that you could have thought we were trying out material for confidential. Among those present was a scientist who had worked on the first atomic bomb at Alamogordo in New Mexico, and he was telling how they were so scared stiff, stiff that nobody wanted to push the button. He was in a trench. It seemed he waited for hours for the explosion. He finally got so bored he fell asleep. He wore a helmet, and he was resting his head on his arms, part of which was exposed above the trench. When the blast went off, he got a radioactive berm on that arm. He showed it to us. There was no need of us being so scared, but we were, he said. However, these true confessions didn't stir, stir the ordinance expert to repeat what he had said at the service club about the flying saucers. Um, so what's interesting is there were people on the inside who were working on the UFO file who had wanted to come forward in 1950. And the whole X-Protect group, which exists, remember, inside the Central Intelligence Agency between the aerospace companies, that thing, you know, grew and grew and grew and grew. And now it's a long arm, a long wall of secrecy. But there we have first-person accounts in 1950, uh, you know, going back some 73 years there, which are exactly the same thing that Grush is regurgitating there on the stand with the CIA handlers in the background and the marketing people <laughs> on either side. So, um, you know, this thing has been going on. This game has been going on for a long time. They don't know without losing complete control. They don't know how to roll out or break back in after breaking away and stealing away with the technology. How do they break back in and maintain that control level? The UFO threat gives them the ability to do that. That's why it's central to their cause and their radar. And remember, it's interesting that somebody who was an ultimate insider, really, Fletcher Prouty, when he rewrote his book, The Secret Team, in 1997 and re-released it, he wrote, we always needed an enemy, you know, whether it was the Nazis or the communists. And that secret structure of the CIA was always able to create an enemy. And with the Soviet Union gone, they're going to use UFOs and aliens for this role. That's Prouty. We had it before from Von Braun saying that they were going to do this. We have these warnings from President Kennedy about an announced need for security, destroying all of the traditions that we have of constitutional government in America. When you really listen to Kennedy, <laughs> you realize the depth of the enemy that these intelligence organizations had in this very aware, very well-read, well-studied, well-educated and incredibly canny uh, president. This is not something, I think even for the three years, barely three years that he was in there, they were terrified, you know? Um, and his uh, desire for openness and his freedom uh, vision for the whole world is something that we're seeing mirrored in the language of his nephew, RFK Jr. And that desire, uh, you know, for transparency and openness is also very, very heavy in the Trump campaign. So we're looking at the two enemies, public enemies, number one, but who are the enemies of really? They're the enemies of the intelligence agencies. That's what we're talking about. That's why COG is 
set to come to the rescue in 2024 if things don't go the way that they want them to. Yes, Miss Olivia. Uh, Giza Death Star community, the question is why are they regurgitating the whole ufology narrative and why are they pretending it's all new? And Mind Control Inc., DJ, do you believe they have a timetable for disclosure because it's being forced on them by aliens? <laughs> well, uh, you know, we were, we've been shooting at something with the version of Star Wars that we, we came up with. And there's no question that there are things that were out there when we did our moon journeys and all the rest. The idea of an off-world civilization monitoring us isn't too far out at all. Uh, it's just, it's an incredible, you know, change. It's an incredible cultural change. Some people, you know, whenever they talk about the UFO thing, they kind of, you know, justify any version of doing anything or working with anyone because it's the biggest change in the world. So even working with the CIA would be worth it. You know, it's not the biggest change in the world. I've pointed this out before. Resurrection is a bigger <laughs> realization than aliens. I mean, think about it, you know, uh, and, you know, it's just that it's, it's such a, it's such a cultural awareness if we suddenly knew for a fact but then again, you know, I go back to the Casey work on this and how all unconscious minds are connected. And on some level, there are groups that are aware of this already. So it's just, you know, it's coming in to the general stream of humanity, the realization around the whole thing. Um, there are already groups who are aware of the things that we're talking about. Now, to go back to the deep state angle on the UFO file uh, and, the, and the question that... Uh, Joseph asked, that's really interesting. The, the main points around the UFO file, that there were UFO crashes, which we did redevelopment of and gained incredible levels of technology from, and that the, um, you know, from the traditional stories, there were, you know, these dead bodies that were found at the Roswell crash, at the Aztec crash, and they were about four feet tall. In some cases, they looked Asian. Um, in other cases, they almost look like children. Uh, but then people who encountered beings like them, like the Betty and Barney Hill case and such, it's a little different. It's a little different. They're not grays, right? They're kind of like people, but different. Um, there's a very interesting quote that I, I have for tonight, which comes from the work of Robert Sarbarker. I have read it on this program before, but I think it's, it's absolutely crucial. Um, and, oh, I had a whole section on next star. I will save the next star thing. I'm only gathering more data on them anyway, so we're not going to lose anything there. But, um, there's a quote from Robert Sarbarker. And since we have the Oppenheimer movie out there, I think this is important. Um, the Oppenheimer movie doesn't get into the UFO file, right? It's, it's just... You know, it's centered on all the atomic activities that we're aware of. And there's a weird thing supposedly in having the movie out, which is almost popularizing the thing. But certainly Oppenheimer's an incredible character for us to uh, contemplate. And he was deep in the UFO file. In uh, someone who worked side by side with him and someone who was well-respected as a top physicist of his day was Robert Sarbarker, who was best friends with Thomas Townsend Brown, and he was a student of Einstein. Uh, there's a lot of very interesting stories about Sarbarker and Brown relating to the UFO file, their trips to Cuba, all kinds of very interesting things, which in our Hot Zone episodes we've covered, but just you wait for what we're going to come forward with on that. But just for the record, so we understand how much of a regurgitation the uh, testimony of Grush is, this whole idea that, oh, he's the first one who ever came forward and said this from the government. No, look, this is not an MJ-12 document, nothing. This is a series of letters back and forth from Steinman to uh, a number, a couple of different UFO researchers and about the Aztec UFO case, the one I mentioned earlier. And we did an episode on Aztec a couple of months ago that I would recommend you check out. But just for the record, okay, uh, and this guy was kind of rubbed out of history. You can't even find a Wikipedia page for him at this point. 
dear Mr. Steinman, um, I'm sorry to have taken so long answering your letters. Steinman is the guy who was a researcher, really hot to trot on the Aztec case. And he was a very kind of rambunctious <laughs> character. And he wanted to get these guys on the record. And he did some incredible things so that his book is kind of a tome uh, that is so important if you're doing this research and ex steganography is, is right in the core of it as well. And that side by side with the Ramsey books on the Aztec case, you'll have a much better uh, fundamental un understanding about how the deep state took the UFO file and hit it. Okay. So this is Sar Barker. I have moved my office and I've had to make a number of extended trips to answer your last question from October 14th, 1983. There's no particular reason I feel I shouldn't, or I couldn't answer any and all of your UFO questions. I'm delighted to answer all of them to the best of my ability. You listed some of your questions on September 12th in your letter. I'll attempt to answer them as you had listed them relating to my own experience regarding recovered flying saucers. I had no association with any of the people involved in the recovery and have no knowledge regarding the dates of the recoveries. If I had, I would send it to you regarding verification that persons you list were involved. I can say this, John von Neumann was definitely involved. Dr. Vannevar Bush was definitely involved. Uh, he points out that Vannevar Bush led the program and Robert Oppenheimer also Steinman continued, my association with the Research and Development Board under Dr. Compton during the Eisenhower administration was limited. So although I had been invited to participate in several discussions associated with the recoveries, I couldn't personally attend some of the meetings. I'm sure they would have asked Dr. Von Braun and others that you listed who were probably asked and may have attended. This is what I know for sure. I did receive official reports when I was at my office at the Pentagon but all of these were left there at the time. We were never supposed to take them out of the office. I do not recall receiving photographs such as you mentioned. There was more to come from Steinman, from Sarbarker. I recall the interview with Dr. Brenner at the Canadian Embassy. I think the answers I gave him were the ones you listed. That's where he said the UFO file was above the atomic uh, program, atomic bomb program in terms of secrecy. I would have been able to give even more specific answers. Um, you must understand, I took this assignment as a private contribution. We were called dollar a year men. My first responsibility was the maintenance of my own business activity so that my participation was somewhat limited. The only thing I remember at this time is that certain materials reported to have come from flying saucer crashes were extremely light and very tough. I'm sure our laboratories analyzed them very carefully. These were reports uh, that instruments or people operating these machines were also of very light weight, sufficient to withstand the tremendous deceleration and acceleration associated with their machinery. I remember in talking with some of the people at the office that I got the impression these aliens were constructed like certain insects we have observed on the earth, wherein because of the low mass, the inertial forces involved in operation of these instruments would be quite low. Then Sarbarker says, finally, I still do not know why the high order of classification has been given and why the denial of the existence of these devices. I'm sorry it's taken me so long to reply, but I suggest you get in touch with others. And he gives them a list. Now, uh, and he has a strange death after he's talking to him and Friedman and others um, where he goes to open his car door and there's jelly on it. And then he feels sick. He goes to the hospital. He calls his son and says, um, something strange happened. You know, as soon as I held this jelly, got this jelly on my hand, I started having heart pains. So uh, I think that Expertech rubbed out Sarbarker, but even if they didn't, he let out enough there. <laughs> you don't need MJ-12 or anything else. They had worked, uh, they had done recovery on these objects and the bodies that they discovered, they felt someone had made uh, using a kind of an insect as maybe the, the cloning piece. So however you want to interpret that as alien or as an advanced group here, it's on the record. It's already on the record. You didn't need Grush, didn't need any of that CIA rehash. But it is interesting, is it not, that the deep state in rolling this out now is using all the key points that have already come through the UFO field 
as the jumping off point and completely ignoring the secret space aspect. Everyone, you're watching the Dark Journalist Show. This is X Election, COG 2024, CIA UFO Threat PSYOP. We'll take a couple more of your questions. And this is a fascinating, you know, area of study <laughs> that we're in. And I want to say um, in relation to the Grush thing, you know, that um, it's another attempt by the Central Intelligence Agency to push an alien threat narrative down our throat. And there may be, you know, people who are, you know, legitimate journalists and good at, at other things. When they get around the UFO file, they don't realize the level of what's to lose by the deep state by either sharing uh, the UFO file or having someone discover what they've been up to with it. And that's the nature of the problem around that secrecy. And uh, that, I think, is the great gap in uh, the knowledge that's going on that I see, even in earnest people outside the mainstream media, like I mentioned the guy who went on Glenn Beck, Schellenberg, I'm sure he wants to figure it out, but he, he doesn't know anything about it. You know, and that is a cultural thing because after all, you know, the intelligence agencies made it untouchable. They decimated the field. You couldn't, there was no, Stanton Friedman told me um, before he died that there was no one to take his place and there was no field that came up after him because they had starved out that field. So I think that was by design, which is why when you got to this point where they were like, we're going to push this stuff out, there wouldn't be any resistance or the people would be, you know, elderly or they wouldn't be with us anymore. And what you would have instead are just gadfly opportunists <laughs> and opsters. And you get those together is you know, so many of, of them that, um, you know, we're, this is what we're looking at. So I think that this is a pivotal moment culturally going forward with a true understanding of what the ufo file is which we've tried to lay out on this program and i think through the work of people like gg young dr farrell and others you're going to get very you know you're getting right into the heart of the thing and i think through the x series material you're going to have an understanding of the reasons of hiding that x technology inside the ufo file and how the x technology doesn't have to be extraterrestrial um, necessarily. That's, that's pretty fascinating. And I can tell you that in the work that I did when I got past the secrecy of the 20th century using X steganography, I went, every time I went back a century, I found the X steganography and all of the advanced mystical concepts mixed with the advanced technology going side by side with the X steganography back, back and back in time. And then it made me wonder, uh, how old, how old is this? It's not from 1947. It's very old. <laughs> yes. Bolsla Toporek. How are the deep state and the breakaway civilization tied together slash related to each other? Well, um, the breakaway civilization kind of runs <laughs> the deep state. And, um, you know, I've, the way that Professor Scott brought forward the deep state, he said, think of it as a parallel uh, system. And so therefore, uh, the elements involved in the deep state he listed on the bottom was organized crime. The next level was the intelligence agencies and all of their international finance connections, then the world of high finance. But in between that were all of the contractor groups like Booz Allen Hamilton and others who circulate and orbit the intelligence agencies and kind of go off and do their kind of shadow errands for them. And then the higher pinnacle piece was the financial controlling powers. Now, that's the deep state as, as he has laid it out. On this program... The, uh, the deep state aspect mirrored by the UFO file goes into this other structure. So the ExProtect group, you know, that whole line of, of research represents a fact that the UFO file is kind of the great secret of history. And in modern history, that is 
say from World War II on, it becomes a central factor that's operating but is invisible because it's not reported on. And yet it's visible enough that people on the ground see it, pilots see it, people have experiences with it. So it becomes part of the human engagement process. And what happens is um, the media tries to take that piece. And so, you know, the intelligence agencies are thinking, well, we can't control how this, you know, phenomena manifests to people. So what do we do with it? We try to control how they think about it. And uh, that's where I think we see so much of the coaching and the narrative control, the narrative manipulation about what it is we're talking about and looking at. And so the threat, I think, being the ultimate most dangerous uh, narrative that they're bringing forward around it. And you do see, you know, um, there's, there's starting to be an awareness around that. But they know how to adjust. When they get into trouble around the threat thing, they hold it under for a while and they bring forward Avi Loeb and they're like, hey, Avi Loeb, you know, he's finding AI artifacts from Amuamua. <laughs> and, you know, we're going to deal with that this way. And then when they feel like, okay, we've, we've gotten out of that thing of people knowing that we're pushing a UFO threat, let's get back to the threat narrative. And now you see all these articles again, you know, coming out. Now, I know a lot of people who are in the media who watch this show, they're aware of the UFO threat thing. When we brought forward the nature of the UFO threat, those people were listening. And I think that the, um, the accumulated activity of, you know, the ideas from these people listening and all the rest pushed back the UFO threat piece because it became too obvious and it was clumsily rolled out um, by Elizondo and other people. But I think the UFO threat piece is coming back with a vengeance. It never goes away. It's just one of the major plans that they have. And um, now I think that they're positioned, uh, they felt they were positioned with Grush, who remember was there giving his testimony on the same day that the new COG commander was being uh, run through the Senate the same day, July 26th for them to be doing that, you know, hours apart, uh, I think is very significant. So when we think about things in this perspective, then, um, the fumbling that occurs, you know, like they had a lot of fumbles with TTSA, even though you had top CIA people running it, this fumble with Grush, um, and the attempt to spin it, to insulate themselves by saying, oh, the, that bad CIA is after Grush, but then the people saying that are CIA. See how that works? <laughs> Grush is being put out there by CIA people, so CIA people aren't after him. He is the embodiment of the CIA. So he's their op. Um, so when you think of it that way, the situation starts to clear itself out. I do not, uh, I do not feel that at this stage, they expected Grush to get hit with his past and you know, being in a psychologically uh, in a detention facility and things of that nature, which, you know, uh, in terms of his story, destabilizes the legitimacy of the things that he was saying because of the mental issues that were involved. That would just be anyone's first, you know, it's not uh, this idea that you can somehow get around that by being PC or something doesn't make any sense. If somebody has psychological episodes and then goes out before Congress and says, I saw aliens, then a lot of people are going to put those two things together. You know, that is the nature of investigatory things. If that were a legal case, the legal team on the other side would take that and run it hard, you know, so let's just be realistic about it. And um, the, the way that they're trying to soft pedal that in News Nation, like you can't mention it, uh, it's just a way to insulate the fact that they're op stepped, you know, in a puddle and, you know, their opster is tripping now and they may have to bobo him and move on to the next guy. Hey, Senator Rubio said, well, if you don't like Grush, I've got 27 other whistleblowers we can run up here. I'm sure they have quite a few. So I expect it to be a rather long run up to the 2024 election. Yes. This is a great question. Debbie McAdoo, was Grush in the mental facility to get brainwashed into running this narrative? Well, that's a very interesting question. It's Look, a creative question. I'll tell you this. Um, Grush, what I'm interested in 
is how Grush met McCullough because McCullough was involved with the NRO and the NRO is honeycombed with CIA people. As a matter of fact, the NGA, uh, the people who do the training are CIA people. So he, Grush being in the NGA and the NRO, like you're just surrounded by CIA people. I wonder if, um, they also said that uh, early on that this guy, the Patriot Act, McCullough guy, Charles McCullough, that he was involved with the idea of whistleblower protections. And it was very interesting when I was talking to John Warner uh, about his cousin and some of the things that his cousin had said. He said, you know, Chris Mellon, John Warner said, you know what disturbs me is I think what they're doing with the whistleblower protection is protecting the whistleblowers who are saying the things that they want to hear for their narrative and not real whistleblowers. You get a real whistleblower and you end up kind of like Julian Assange or worse. So, you know, the whistleblowers they're going to tout out there and protect are going to be saying the things that they want them to say about, oh, 1950s bodies and all the rest of it. So uh, alien bodies. For me, that's an incredible insight. A penny drop when he was talking about that <laughs> rather dramatically. Yes. Okay, this is a series of questions. Rehoboth Farm. The NRO was also ultimately behind Jade Helm, which seems to have been an effort to determine how quickly information and panic travel through the population. Maybe this is the same. Alchemy by Angela says false alien invasion or, quote, alien virus or an, another virus released would be considered emergencies. And Wendy Eater says, will COG plans include a vaccine to protect us against aliens? Well, when you get to the medical side of all this, it gets very interesting because one of the first things, if you go back, I think four years ago, I did a show with Gigi Young and we went through the bios of the TTSA people and they all had very strange uh, molecular biology degrees. And uh, in the case of some of them, they had patented their own diseases. Um, I thought that that was very strange. And uh, for me, that's where a lot of this was coming from. But I will tell you something about those other questions. Instead of um, thinking about any particular operation, think of it this way. There's a, a pattern that Professor Scott refers to called piggybacking. And so, for example, on 9-11, they, you know, the nation's defenses are going through a defense about bin Laden flying planes into a building, right? And so they have all these defenses set up doing that. And then something, uh, another group, the COG group, for example, or some deep state group comes in and they piggyback on the op and make it, take it live, right? There was a weird thing that um, Trump's CIA director, Pompeo, said when he was talking about COVID, he said they took the exercise and they made it live. This is a weird banter going on. And even Trump looks at him weird, like, what are you talking about? <laughs> but um, that piggybacking thing is very important. So, you know, you'll notice when you get around deep state events, always close by, there's a drill or something going on in relation to it. Um, you know, something that was supposed to be just like it, for example, during the Boston bombing of the marathon thing, there was a whole drill going on about terrorist activity during a marathon. And so something crept in and piggybacked on top of that and pulled off an actual op. Um, so this is the piggybacking thing is something that I think gets to what you were saying there in those NRO questions, which is there could be all kinds of ops that are taking place in relation to, you know, we, we had it with 9-11, of course, but in relation to the UFO file, they could be setting up ops for defending against something that they're seeing. And then this other thing comes in and it's like, aha, you know, they're already preparing and laying this out. Now we'll just, you know, jump in on this thing and make it go live. Uh, that I think is a very incredible insight on behalf of, uh, Professor Scott, and that it gives us maybe something to really work with in relation to this, about this kind of other players on the world stage taking advantage of or piggybacking on um, legitimate exercises um, of defending against something that might come in from space. 
<laughs> Absolutely fascinating. Everyone, just a tremendous show here tonight. The Dark Journal's ex-COG election, 2024, the CIA UFO threat, PSYOP. I had some other things here about Trump and RFK Jr., which I will continue to keep an eye on um, for this. Of course, RFK Jr. is suing Google and YouTube over censorship. And, uh, you know, every time he does a deep interview, uh, then phew, they just take it down. So he's still under intense, and I mean intense amount of censorship. There was one story I wanted to mention, and I'll do more reporting on this, I promise. But it's Bill Gates moving his nuclear uh, project to West Virginia. I think this is significant and relates to a number of these things. What Bill Gates, nuclear project is he involved in? Oh, we brought this up uh, a few months ago that he got involved in creating nuclear power, energy, and nuclear reactors. And Bill Gates is looking to West Virginia as he plans for the next phase of his effort to reboot U.S. nuclear energy technology, powering the East Coast. How does that make you feel? Microsoft co-founder Gates, who visited a closed-down coal fire plant in Glasgow, West Virginia, on Monday, said he needs to know how his natrium nuclear reactor demonstration in Wyoming performs before making any announcements about new sites of course the cheneys they're there in wyoming <laughs> and uh, gates is there with a nuclear reactor i think the people of wyoming deserve better than that but um keep an eye you know i think keeping an eye on gates especially around nuclear energy you know uh, considering the reckless psychotic activity around his uh, global vaccine efforts that's one to watch shall we say and with that, Miss Olivia, okay, I'm going to turn it over to you. I do want to circle back around to what we were saying right before that. Debbie McAdoo said the alien vaccine makes sense given Mellon's touting Fauci. And Charlotte Knight says, I just saw today about future virus X. Oh, yeah. Well, Nolan is an immunologist, and he was the one who is, you know, high-fiving Frenchy, <laughs> Fauci, mm -hmm. Frenchy. He's being Frenchy with him. Um, Fauci online. Uh, but he is, you know, the COO, um, Grush is the COO of this Soul Foundation, S-O-L, and the on the Charters of Incorporation for that organization, we have Gary Nolan. So Nolan is working with Grush. You see how the network works. And so this idea of Fauci UFO disclosure, yes, <laughs> because uh, Fauci and Nolan are close and we have Nolan doing all these wonderful you know accolades online about Fauci like your incredible dedication to humanity congratulations <laughs> so that's Nolan and you know I have a clip of Nolan let's see if I've got this queued up right but this is Nolan admitting at this SALT uh, finance conference that he used the UFO threat and so all this thing <laughs> that's great I just I clicked on that and it said Van Halen. <laughs> let's let's go. I'll play Van Halen instead. Um, okay, here we go. I this is it. This is Gary Nolan speaking at the Salt Conference about using the UFO threat. Okay, and for for all those people like, oh no, Nolan's not doing that, and you know all those UFO researchers, etc. Uh, just listen to that. Okay, so he has a justification. I'm going to go back and turn this up so we can listen to it again. Wait a minute. All right, so we've used the threat narrative, Gary Nolan. That's Gary Nolan at the SALT conference. Okay, let's try this again. He tries to justify why he did it later, but he's saying, oh, we used a UFO threat narrative. Well, you know, that's the crux of my reporting on Nolan, TTSA, and all those people is, they're using a UFO threat narrative and their whole defense was, no, no, it's not. And here he is at the conference being like, well, actually it is. <laughs> and that's Nolan. I mean, Nolan is their main guy, you know, he's the, uh, the head of the soul foundation. All right, here we go. Ready? You know, we've used, I'm just going to be honest, we've used the threat narrative that these things are showing up repeatedly. I mean, this is today. They're showing up repeatedly around our, our ships. So I think we've, the, the objective has been to make it okay to talk about it. Yeah. Because because we made it okay to talk about it, 
we opened the apertures on the filters on the sensor systems. That's what partly led to the seeing of those Chinese balloons. <laughs> so now he's taking credit for seeing the Chinese balloons. Um, so Gary Nolan, the immunologist that the CIA, uh, you know, has been working with for a decade on their projects, and who's high-fiving, you know, friends with Fauci and all that stuff, and who's a Stanford professor who claims that he was abducted, and that's why he's so interested in this. And he's in this SOL Foundation, which Grush is the COO of and Mellon is the financier of. So it's all one big organization, the UFO Threat Organization, Inc. <laughs> and there they are. I mean, and there's no one admitting it's a threat. So... You know, we don't even have to have a debate. He just admitted everything that I've been saying about what their program is about. So the question is, um, you know, if they're going to promote a threat, you know, what he's giving a reason, oh, you know, we did that because we could change the apertures and see other stuff. It's all nonsense. They already have changed apertures. You know, there's no way that NORAD <laughs> wasn't using apertures to see balloons. It's ridiculous. I don't know who they think they're talking to in relation to this, but it's almost amusing. But there is no one anyway, for the record. Yes. Oh, sorry, I'm, you caught me in a bad moment. <laughs> there is no bad moment. Everyone, <laughs> you're watching the Dark Journalist X election, COG 2024, CIA UFO threat PSYOP. We're going to sign off for tonight, but Miss Olivia is going to give us the super chats of the evening and uh we're also going to come back at you next week with more and this question Can is I, thank you me... dj and olivia and all those in the ideas room many in body one in mind as we move civilization closer to disclosure and ascension and that's the buddhas of boston sports beautiful wow huh excellent yes so I actually, I, uh, I'm going to read off the um, Super Chats, but I want you to think about something to answer when I'm done, which is Hunter Moon's question, what would a real disclosure look like in your opinion? So Very different. <laughs> do you want to just answer it now? No, go ahead. Okay. So, Gil and Joy are Bobo the Clown, a cult fan, Catherine Rorden, W.C. Ray, Center Universe, Fulcanelli, Global Atlantis, Johnny Ricardo Bound, Echo Cat 23, Eurythmia is Fun, Nancy Mercier, uh, Erica Swenson Elliott, Bill Monahan, Amarillo Gunrunners, Jackson, Wolfgang McCarthy, Medley Childress, Debbie McAdoo, Hunter Moon, Terry Dougherty, MC, Robert Scott, Lou Dontol, and the Buddhas of Boston Sports. Thank you so much for your generous wow. super chats. Wow, incredible. And uh, your support for us and what we do on this show and to all our subscribers and the people who support us here, thank you. Uh, we couldn't do it without you, and uh, we want the ability to bring you these incredible reports. Uh, so your support makes all the difference. With that, um, and that question that Miss Olivia threw out there, um, tell me, what was that again? So what would real disclosure look oh, like Oh yeah, to real you? disclosure. Um, well, instantly it would involve the idea of unraveling the history of X-Protect and what they've done to hide the secret. Second, it would oh, be an entirely open process um, where you would call in a civilian control, so civilian scientists, civilian liaisons to, um, you know, you wouldn't have CIA people involved, actually. Uh, the CIA would just be, um, you know, dissolved <laughs> at that point. And um, what you would have is the ability, you know, that the sign that you'd have something legitimate in terms of the disclosure going on would be um, an acknowledgement of the history that uh, they've had in relation to it, what's gone on uh, in terms of that wall of secrecy and how this group is no longer in power and here are the records of the things that they've done. And um, you'd get the transparency around the science, the medicine, and uh, the, the world you know, piece and the things that they've kept for themselves, but it is almost like asking for a utopia. I don't believe in government disclosure. I never have. And um, what I do believe is that they would take a partial truth and make it a whole lie, as it were. So um, that's how I think that they, they would run. Uh, this is how they're running the false disclosure program. But there is a way, I think that um, what happens in the middle of all this is it kind of exposes them to a degree um, not in the way that, you know, we can get the kind of transparency on the government side, but we can see their motives better. 
And when they bring the, that in, then watch out because once we get a hint of their motives, things get a little bit differently. Also on our side, as I've pointed out, um, we, you know, if all subconscious minds are connected, then we are connected to the things that they are seeing as well. Also, there are people who have nothing to do with government. <laughs> you know, think about, I mean, Edgar Casey didn't have anything to do with government and he opened up a great deal of things relating to um, our role in a humanity's role in the cosmos. So, you know, let's think about these things differently. And um, that whole weird addictive thing about government disclosure comes with a price. <laughs> and um, I think, you know, what do they say about cocaine, right? They say cocaine is great when you're doing it, but then it really leaves you, you know, um, devastated or whatever. That's what this is like. And um, so let's not, you know, I think we've had enough false uh, disclosure and false political movements and thinking around this. And um, for me, the way you get to legitimate disclosure is by exposing it to a point where they have to admit it. That's different. That's a totally different thing. When they're at a point where they can't get around the truth, then that's the, when the citizen has the leadership under those circumstances, you know, uh, in there, you know, that's when the leadership will buckle. And, um, in the meantime, unfortunately we have a situation where they're getting bigger and bigger and they haven't really ever been reined in. So this is the nature of the problem. I think that we face militarily in Ukraine and around the globe. Uh, but certainly with the UFO file and the COJ program, their arrogance has increased dramatically, uh, through the Kennedy assassination, the Watergate years, Iran Contra, you know, the things that they were able to accomplish, I think even the destruction of the Challenger um, missions in the 80s, the, the manned missions, which were part of Kennedy's vision after all. So, um, you know, it's, it's a battle. And on the cosmos level, I leave it to the kind of Steiner aspect of the battle uh, with Ahriman. But um, just on the face of it, what you have is an emerging awareness in some sectors of the culture. And then you have an incredible um, effort to force them through tools of propaganda and media not to go down certain roads and avenues of truth. So we find ourselves sitting in a situation where... Um, the awareness level of humanity itself needs to rise up. And that doesn't have anything to do with the government, unfortunately. <laughs> so, yes. Joseph responded, um, good point. If it's genuine disclosure, it's also the dissolution of the CIA. Disclosure is exposure. There's no question. Uh, that's absolutely true. The CIA is extra constitutional from, from its inception. Even the founder, uh, the you know, the president who wrote it into law, he said that in 1963, and he basically said, mend it or end it. You know, uh, that's really the nature. And that happens a month after the Kennedy assassination. What does that tell you? If you read it, he knows, you know, Truman knows, Eisenhower knew. Uh, they saw the thing, right? And uh, this is the nature of the situation. That's why it's so important, I think, with this being the 60th anniversary of the Kennedy assassination for uh, a tremendous push for disclosure around that. And that's why I think Bobby Kennedy running and it, it's just significant on so many different levels and you can feel the echo and the power of this whole thing right now. That's what we're in the middle of. Remember 2023 is a setup year for 2024, but in a sense, this is where the real battle takes place. And I want to also say in relation to Grush and everything else, um, you know, if somebody has been through a, a mental episode, you know, um, it, it's not, that doesn't disqualify them, you know, from knowing things or saying things that are true or anything like that. You know, obviously there's all sorts of different levels. The real uh, issue, you know, I knew with Grush that there were things in the background from my own research that were going to come out, but the real issue that bothers me in relation to Grush and his control there with Cole Hart and McCullough is that they kept that out of the interview and they made it seem like when he asked him a direct question uh, about 
anything in his past or any condition that he has that would alter his perception. He said, no, there's no problem. And then they left out this other thing in case it did come out. That's very deceptive activity. And uh, that's more disqualifying than any episode that he had in his life or any time in a psychological facility. Although if anyone makes the point about those things, they're not off limits when you're talking about somebody who's coming forward with claims like that. Of course, in any situation of investigation, you would consider the person's state of mind. That's obvious, you know, but, um, but I think to make it clear, you know, that's the best way for us to think about it. And with that, I'm going to do some shout outs here at the end. Okay. Unless good. you have anything nope. else. We're okay. Good. Nicely done, Miss Olivia. Bravo. Fantastic. All right. Ivan Langley. Word. <laughs> <laughs> There's Dr. Joseph. Uh, <laughs> we don't want that. I've got to catch. I'll catch that. I'll read the rest of that later. Golden Girl. Pono. Martin Taylor. Don Newway. The first batch of nuclear fuel has been dispatched to China. For CFR 600 sodium cooled pool type fast neutron nuclear reactor, Zai Pu in China's Fuhan province. Huh, that sounds very interesting. Interesting indeed. Uh, wow. Hunter Moon, thank you for answering my question. It means so much because of the way we can try to understand. Absolutely. An excellent question, in fact. Thank you very much. Uh, no worries, Ray. Agenda 2030, well underway and counting down to 2030. Hey, remember event 201? <laughs> and uh, it's very interesting that that hit in you know, the Bill Gates event, gaming out a pandemic the November before or the October before it hit. Well, it's very interesting because the person deeply involved with that was Avril Haynes, who is now the director of national intelligence dni and uh, she's the one who oversaw the meeting at wright patterson before all this alien stuff came out so put those dots together <laughs> um black zionist ivan langley wayne peak beth noise fantastic to see everyone here uh, i know kate's out there it's great to see you and let's see anybody else karen carpenter Aha, uh -huh. it's great to see you. Wait, wait, aren't all countries doing a military exercise this week? That's that all about. Oh, gee, <laughs> I have heard about some of those interesting uh, things. And uh, of course, it's all a distraction against the Peruvian aliens, yep. right? That's <laughs> you know, there was a question that yeah. I did not get to, but I don't know the answer <laughs> to, which I'm just going to throw out there. Mm. Um, Mind Control Inc., who did they hand off Majestic 12 to? Uh, well, it's it never really went away. I mean, it's been, it's an integrated group, but uh, X Protect, in my opinion, is the overseer, and you know they haven't left at all. Uh, behold, the congressional hearings on UFOs and the distractions they're in. But yeah, it's a good question. Mm -hmm. The naming, it's majestic, was always very interesting. Uh, <laughs> Caritas Taro. Bigger and bigger, sloppier and crazier. <laughs> <laughs> the truth will prevail. Terry Doherty. Wow. Careful what you ask for. Absolutely. Great questions. The ideas room was rocking tonight. I have to say, I give you real credit for, uh, you know, stimulating me to think about a number of things that I, I wasn't really on top of. So thank you very much. We will see you all next week. And, uh, you know, it's been fantastic being here with you. Erica Swanson Elliott is great. The hot zone is hot today, apparently getting hotter. Thanks for exposing the light, DJ and Olivia. <laughs> Thank you for being here, Erica. And we look forward to hearing more from you. We will be back with you next week. And although it says end broadcast, after all, never really ends. It never really ends. Fantastic to be here with you, everyone. Have a fantastic uh, weekend and uh, enjoy the summer. It's almost over. You know, yes. don't let the turkeys get you down. We have to find a way to enjoy ourselves regardless, right? No question. Uh, a couple of anniversaries that have come up, Marilyn Monroe's passing, uh, that just happened. The dropping of 73rd anniversary of the dropping of the atomic bomb. Is that right? It is, or 78th. That's what it is. Um, that's kind of a, 
a dreadful one. And the death of Elvis Presley, mm. uh, August 15th. That's another one of those. August just has those incredible things. I guess that's part of the lion's gate, as it were, transformative and challenging. Uh, no question about it. We will see you all next week. And remember, never let it be forgot that once there was a Camelot and there could be again, hey, Bobby's trying real hard here. <laughs> so have a great night, everyone. God bless.